All right, I think we're good to go. Is it loud enough? Yeah. Um, yeah, very warm welcome to you uh, guys on a Friday evening in Berlin. We are very glad to facilitate this uh, event with our guest speaker, Vijay Prashad, which, which of course, probably, who of course everyone knows. Uh, I want to give, uh, give a short introduction uh, on uh, who we are, the International Research Institute uh, on the GDR. Um, um, and want to give a short intro also on why we think that this debate that we uh, chose to do for tonight is a very timely one. And, uh, but first of all, uh, welcome to you, Vijay. It's not, it's not a rock concert. The doggy is happy, that's the most important thing. <laughs> all right, uh, I'm sure you guys all know, but um, for those who don't, uh, Vijay is the director of the Tricontinental Institute, a chief correspondent for the independent media channel Globetrotter, chief editor of the Left Word Books, author of many, many books, from which we at least have, uh, I don't know, if the latest one, no. uh, okay, one of the latest ones, uh, very active writer, obviously, also, uh, um, yeah, for you to, to buy. Um, yeah, for today's event, maybe uh, for, of spe specific importance, Vijay's uh, active in the network uh, alliance of the No Cold War, uh, which is a worldwide platform to counter the growing aggression of US imperialism, in particular against China. Um, before I start, as I said, a short introduction about the International Research Institute DDR. We chose to use the German acronym because uh, the GDR is mostly, well, also worldwide known for the DDR. Um, so uh, our connection to VJ is through the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, with whom we work closely together um, uh, with the, for our studies and other publications. In short, we could say that our aim is to enrich current debates with the experiences of the uh, socialist camp, of the um, uh, yeah, uh, of the um, uh, socialist camp of the last century, in particular of the, uh, of the German Democratic Republic. Uh, for us, it is uh, crucial from a standpoint from those who want to overcome the atrocities of imperialism and capitalism to closely study um, the experiences of people who try to build up in a different society, a socialist society. So this is, uh, in general, uh, our... Yeah, from where we come from, and um, we want to shed light on the successes and concre concrete contradictions and problems throughout, throughout which this society developed. Uh, I want to uh, uh, very much encourage everyone to check our website, but, but also take the time of tonight to maybe look into our materials and maybe sign up for our German newsletter, if there's uh, some German-speaking crowd here as well. And um, I want to especially put focus on the latest studies that we did on the socialist healthcare system of the GDR, which is very timely reminded of the corona uh, pandemic that we all just went through, but also the first study that we published, which gives an overall introduction of the GDR, its role in the world, and its um, way to progress. So um, the special thing about this research center, I'd say, is that we aim to um, reach an international audience that is very e actively involved in the struggles for social progress. Uh, currently, we are working on a third study that is uh, focusing on agricultural uh, system of the GDR, but I also very much want to shed light on just a recent uh, archive that we uh, started, which we call Friendship. Um, obviously related to the Freundschaft, um, which used to be the greeting uh, in the Freie Deutsche Jugend, um, but also uh, actually has a lot to tell from the, uh, about the relation that the GDR urged to establish between the peoples of the world. Um, so with this archive, we try to shed light on 
the um, international strategy and anti-imperialist uh, uh, stance of the socialist camp. And um, not only focusing on the GDR, but in a, on a broader sense, we have uh, several also shorter articles on the uh, socialist orientation of Mali, which is very timely, looking at the imperialist uh, uh, military mission that uh, has just been kicked out by the uh, Malian people. Um, uh, but also on the Republic of Afghanistan, we have uh, an interesting interview on about the uh, apartheid, uh, the struggle against apartheid and its relation with the uh, socialist camp. So there's lots of interesting stuff that is not just uh, interesting to understand the history, but actually uh, um, really from the standpoint of yeah, building this new kind of internationalist um, uh, front, in a way, <coughs> anti-imperialist front. So there's uh, much to learn about the uh, ideological debates that uh, our former comrades had. Um, so yes, maybe we can also make a little bit room uh, for the new guests to come and use every chair that there is. That would be great. All right, what else? Um, okay, we have uh, around two uh, hours for this event. We will uh, also record it. Um, uh, it will only be in English, although you can, of course, uh, later on we, we open up for you to ask questions. You can also post them in German and we'll, we will be able to translate. Um, and before uh, I hand it over, just in short, why we chose this topic. India just recently rejected to become a, a member of NATO+. Plus. South Africa will hold a BRICS meeting in August, probably not following ICC rules on arresting Putin. We'll see. Kenya's President Ruto confronts Macron with his objection to IMF and World Bank, as many African leaders have recently uh, shown a, a, um, yeah, a fierce stance against the imperialist um, institutions. Saudi Arabia, Arabia open, uh, is open to undermine the petrodollar and much, much more. Especially driven by the escalation in the war in Ukraine in February last year, there's a growing sentiment of opposing the rule of the most powerful Western imperialist countries and their organizations. Many countries from the Global South take a neutral position toward the war, not following the sanctions politics to, of NATO and their position to isolate and ruin Russia. In contrast, we see as another example, the people of Mali, which I just mentioned, celebrate the throwing out of French and German military troops and the end of UN's MINISMA mission. However, this is a highly contradictive situation, as for example the role of India in the US-led Quad Alliance, but also the anti-people politics of leaders such as the South African Ramaphosa and India's Modi show. What seems to be at stake is the US-led order of imperialism that has been established after the Second World War with its institutions, institution and hierarchy. Um, if, if we don't have enough chairs, I guess people can also sit on the tables on the back. <laughs> so, again, what seems to be at stake is the US-led order of imperialism that has been established after the Second World War with its institution and hierarchy. However, sentiments of countering this so-called rule-based order is very rarely connected to ideas of socialism. This, strength, this strengthened opposition and sovereignty has been repeatedly compared with the non-alignment of, of the latter century. The grasp, uh, to grasp the dynamics and directions of current developments, more precisely, we want to deepen this discussion by better understanding the differences and similarities of the non-alignment of the 20th century. We want to start by discussing some concrete characteristics of the former non-alignment and its role in, in the conflict between imperialism and socialism before we want to talk about your understanding, BJ, of the current developments. The overall question, one could say, of this event is to understand the connection between the opposition against imperialism and socialism. The tie between national sovereignty and socialism. How can progressive forces of today intervene support and push certain anti-imperialist sentiments towards the direction of socialism. 
I think I'll just pass the uh, microphone to you, Vijay. Um, but maybe I can just ask you. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, if we could maybe, before we jump into sort of the strategies and all that, if you could just maybe contextualize the non-aligned movement, you know, maybe tell us a little bit about the international situation in which NA the NAM arose, uh, what its central objectives were, and what its sort of, which, cent which social forces were, were behind the NAM. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, um, this afternoon, Matthew and I went to um, near the Tear Garden for a meeting at the Museum of World Culture. Amazing, amazing building, um, which is on John Foster, Foster Dulles Aller. Um, and then this evening, Matthew, Max, and Mari over there invited me come to a building which is named after Franz Mehring. Uh, what a schizophrenic experience in one day uh, to have started the day at John Foster Dulles Aller, who was basically the greatest imperialist of the US order in his day. Uh, he and his brother Alan Dulles tried repeatedly to kill Fidel Castro. Um, they tried repeatedly to undermine even modest non-alignment. John Foster Dulles called the Bandung Conference which I'll talk about in a minute, neutralist. And he sent Adam Clayton Powell Jr. to undermine the conference. Richard Wright, the great writer, wrote a, to my opinion, one of his worst books about the conference called The Color Curtain, where he was horrified by the fact that people from Asia and Africa were talking about religion. You know, he made that the, the mark of the Bandung conference, not really seeing what it was all about. Um, John Foster Dulles, of course, again with Alan Dulles and John F. Kennedy, um, were the architects of the Bay of Pigs invasion against the great revolution of Cuba. And it's great to see the poster near Mari, Viva la Revolucion, Viva el 26 of Julio. So there it is. John Foster Dulles. I hope Fidel is sitting next to him, snubbing his nose and saying, man, you couldn't kill me. I died of natural causes, so there. <laughs> well, look, we are in a really tough situation in the world. Um, the right wing is everywhere. It's not just a European phenomenon. You know, people are saying, well, the right is going to win the election next in France, as if we're supposed to feel that the right is coming. But the right is already there. In Brazil, for instance, you already had Bolsonaro, and in fact, the Brazilian legislature is dominated by bolsonaristas they are not gone um, you know lula is playing a rear guard action against the bolsonaristas on one side and the central bank of brazil on the other which is trying to squeeze him from a neoliberal direction in india you mentioned already narendra modi prime minister of india leads a neo fascist government in that country um, you know, Recep Tayyip Erdogan playing an extremely interesting role, stymieing NATO's uh, attempt to bring Sweden into the alliance. Nonetheless, what, you know, Erdogan has done in Turkey itself bears reflection for the rise of a certain kind of right. So, yes, I can see that there's worry in Europe. The right is rising. But as usual, Europe is late to the party. Um, Europe is late to the party. You're going to get a right after everybody else has experienced it. But the right is here. And they have, in a sense, the advantage because the left is weak. And because the left is weak, and we're weak because our reservoirs have been weakened, trade unionism weakened, peasant organizations weakened, sustained austerity politics driven by the International Monetary Fund has really demolished the reservoirs of the left, the reservoirs for the left. You can't just build a left from the petty bourgeoisie. You have to build a left from the working class, from the agricultural workers, and so on. You can't build petty bourgeois left formations and just think that's how you're going to transform the world. You will be outflanked by the right. There's a reason why lots of working people get attracted to the politics of the right, because there's a politics of hatred and toxicity that appeals to people. And we haven't been able to counter it by building the phalanxes of the left. And for that reason, one has to always look at what are the contradictions. 
you know, as a, as a Marxist, as a communist, I'm always searching in the world. What are the contradictions? How are things moving? What are the laws of motion of history? We're not looking at the world today just to try empirically to understand what are the facts in this country? What are the facts in that country? This is not empirical science, you know, what's going on in Germany today. No, I'm interested, what are the laws of motion? Where is history going? Where are being, we being propelled? And it's very clear that in most of the global south today, a new mood is detected. There's a new mood. The mood is there, as you said, when Jay Shankar says to a news reporter, NATO plus, we don't want to join NATO plus. And then he says something quite stunning. He's the foreign minister of a right-wing government in India. He says, we reject the NATO template. We reject the NATO template, the NATO way of thinking. That's not for us. It's pretty interesting. How is this possible? What is this mood? Goiter in Mali, the second coup in Mali, the first coup, Goiter says, didn't meet the goals of what people aspire to, which is they want the French out, they want Al-Qaeda out, they want to solve the Tuareg problem, and they want to deal with the fact that they're hungry. New mood with Goiter. What is this mood? How do we create an understanding that links Lula in Brazil wanting to revive the BRICS process Narendra Modi in India, that strange situation that India finds itself in. Then people like Goiter in Mali. How do we bring all this together? You know, what framework, what understanding do we have of the historical process that generates this mood? And I, I wanted to start here, Matthew, because this allows us then to turn backwards. This allows us to go back to the past. Is this a revival of the non-aligned movement? That's the question, right? Is this a revival? Because after all, you can't call this the socialist contradiction to imperialism. It's not. It's not. Mr. Modi is not leading a socialist contradiction to imperialism. He's not even leading a people-centered contradiction to imperialism. This is something else. And so we go back and we say, what was the non-aligned movement? And it's in that sense that I'm going to describe some features of the original non-aligned movement, okay? So it's with that in mind. This is not just a history lesson. I'm going back because I'm interested. How do we understand the laws of motion that are propelling history forward today? Because history is not blocked. That's the key thing. History is not blocked. We are not at a dead end. You know, our time is going to come. And we can see that. And as Marxists, we have to understand the laws of motion in order to give ourselves as Ernst Bloch, the great East German Marxist, said, a principle of hope. Okay, so that's why we're going back. Well, look, when the anti-colonial movements got going in the 19th century, they were inchoate. They didn't have a united agenda. It's very interesting that when the leaders of many of the anti-colonial movements meet in Brussels, of all places, God-forsaken Brussels, which was one-eighth the size of its colony in the Congo. The viciousness of the Belgians in the Congo and a tiny little country, Brussels, is basically an airport, railway station, and, you know, maybe a few universities. How they were able to colonize the Congo, eight times the size of Belgium, it's incredible, right? Well, it's interesting the government in Brussels allowed this conference to be held in 27, 28, almost 100 years ago. But they said, you can come and talk about anti-imperialism, but you can't talk about the Congo. And that's a good enough deal. I would have taken the deal as well. No other country would have allowed them to meet. Okay? And besides that, many of the people who came to that conference went home, were arrested, and were executed. So it was with great bravery that these comrades came to Brussels to discuss a united platform against imperialism. And that's what's interesting. They'd never met each other. They came from bourgeois backgrounds. Jawaharlal Nehru of India comes from a bourgeois background. His father was an important lawyer in, 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 in northern India, in Allahabad. Also, of course, a leader in the Indian National Congress. You have people like Jawaharlal Nehru. You have also radicals coming from China, radicals coming from West Africa, trade union leaders and so on. But they meet and they find that they have a lot in common. That's what's interesting 
about that moment. Very much like our moment. They meet and they say, we are, what do we have in common? We need to establish the sovereignty of our territory. That was a minimum irreducible demand. We don't want to have mandate rule. Remember, the League of Nations after World War I or the Great War, 1919, establishes a principle of the mandate system, the trusteeship system, that when the Ottoman Empire was broken up, well, the Syrians are too stupid to rule themselves. We'll cut Syria up. Some of it we'll give to the French. Some of it we'll give to the British, including Palestine, because those people are childlike. They can't govern themselves. They need to have trustees take care of their faith, you know, their history, their destiny. Too stupid they are, too childlike. That paternalism was at the center of the League Against Imperialism, 1927-28. They all agreed. Actually, to be fair, we're all adults. We're all adults and we can govern ourselves and we need, as an irreducible demand, right of sovereignty over our territory. That was the first demand, okay? Second thing they agreed on, imperialism, nothing good about it. No mission civilization, Mr. Macron, didn't happen. Don't lie about it. None of that, Rishi Sunak, don't lie about it. Don't lie to children in Britain today that imperialism had a good side. This is an issue that has come up in Germany as well. Because, you know, German colonialism in Namibia, in East Africa, and Tanzania, and so-called what was called Tanganyika, there was nothing good about German colonialism in Cameroon. Nothing good about it. It's a vicious act of stealing people's wealth and reducing their sense of humanity. But it's amazing, 2023, these countries, either it's amnesia, and look at France today. France is burning because France will never be able to come to terms with its colonial history. You know, there were tens of thousands of Algerians who marched on the streets of Paris in 1961. The French police attacked them viciously, killed over a thousand of them, and threw their bodies in the Seine. How many of you knew that story? Maybe six people, eight. The four of you in the back, bravo, <laughs> bravo, <laughs> bravo, <laughs> bravo. Thousand people thrown into the Seine, which is supposed to be the river of love. You're supposed to get in a boat and every time you go under a bridge, kiss your lover. There's dead Algerians under you, pals. Dead Algerians. No, imperialism, not good, they said. Second thing, you know, we're not going to, you know, excuse you for doing this to us. We want to establish our own dynamic. And that comes to the third irreducible demand for all of them. We need a project in common. And that's what happened in Brussels in 27. By 1955, when they met in Bandung, 29 states from Africa and Asia, and began to establish what would become the non-aligned movement, many of the states had attained independence. For instance, India, 47, Pakistan, 47, Sri Lanka, 1948, Indonesia, 1948, Egypt, 1952, with Gamal Abdul Nasser's coup against King Farouk. These states came newly independent, really motivated to change the world. And when they came to Bandung in Indonesia, they came with the wind in their sails. Meeting them there in Indonesia was Cho Enlai of the People's Republic of China. It's the first time they had met Cho Enlai and he impressed everybody. Now remember, this Bandung meeting was not a socialist meeting. One of the people there was Sir John Kotalabala of, Sri, of then Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. Sir John, okay, mind you, knighted of, knight of the British Empire. So it wasn't like Sir John Kotalabala was a socialist. He was a conservative, in fact. But he was very pleased to meet Cho Enlai. Why? Asia is standing up. We are not colonized anymore. We are not children and so on. That was the mood in the 1950s. And that's what propelled these people in 1961 to create the non-aligned movement in Belgrade, in Yugoslavia, in Belgrade. That's because Marshal Tito sniffed the wind and he said, I want to have a piece of that. Yugoslavia is an interesting country, is an interesting country. <laughs> Yugoslavia is an interesting country because Yugoslavia saw itself, interestingly, even though in Europe, as very much part of the decolonizing dynamic. Uh, you might know this from Mila Turajic's terrific film, Non-Aligned Newsreel, that it was, in fact, 
Yugoslavia that sent camera crews to Algeria to document the war in Algeria. It was Yugoslavia that sent advisors to the FLN in their war against the French colonial state. Yugoslavia provided all this in anticipation of what the East Germans or the DDR would do for many, many governments, many liberation movements around the world. Um, this was an avenue in which the socialist bloc got directly involved in the non-aligned movement. So just to wrap up the non-aligned, let's say, phase one, they, they were not all of equal political history. They didn't come from the same place. They came from very different itineraries. Secondly, many of the people or their governments that governed their new countries governed with extremely different agendas. Um, Nehru, for instance, comes to Belgrade two years after he's overthrown the first elected communist government in India, the government in Kerala, which won a democratic election in 1957. My party leader, EMS Nambudripad, was the first uh, chief minister of Kerala. And then the Nehru government colluded with the Central Intelligence Agency to build a coup-like condition and overthrew that government in 1959. There's a new book coming out on the coup against the communist government in Kerala, and I'm, I'm calling it a coup, uh, written by the former finance minister of Kerala, T.M. Thomas Isaac. It's going to be a really, really important book because he's going to bring the story of Kerala in line with what happened in Guatemala in 1954 and in Iran in 1953. These are all the coups of the 1950s. So, one. Secondly, they were not all the same kind of political orientation. Their governments. Nehru was leading a bourgeois landlord state with some socialistic tendencies and had an affinity to what was going, going on in the Soviet Union. Um, also, of course, there was Yugoslavia, which tried to position itself already in between the Soviet and the US camps, as it were, and then Egypt, where Gamal Abdul Nasser was leading effectively a military government uh, with some socialist tendencies, but no real socialist program. A range of different uh, agendas these people had, but they were united. And what united them was the antipathy to imperialism, very strong unity, even among the governments of the right in the third world. Don't fantasize that the third world governments of the 1950s were all radical. Many of them were governments of the right, and yet they were united against the encroachment of their sovereignty, which they had just won after a hundred years of struggle. Um, that's what united them, but also what united them was their desperate attempt to create a new international system. Desperate attempt, because they were all poor countries, and because they were poor in capital, they had to run back to Western banks to borrow money, or they had to ask the Soviets to help them build infrastructure in their countries, because they simply didn't have it. Here's a fact for you, and I'll end with this. When Britain left India, the literacy rate in India was 13%, 1-3%. At the same time, the literacy rate in the United Kingdom was 98%. Now tell me, tell me please, that colonialism uh, wasn't a negative impact on a place like India. Uh, thanks Vijay. I think it's also important to point out that at this 1927 uh, conference in Brussels, you know, it was crucially supported also by the Comintern, by the Communist International. You know, it was... Uh, one of the driving forces behind bringing this movement together. And I think it's uh, important to mention that because that's kind of the question of this evening as well, is sort of to what extent can the socialist camps analysis of, of the NAM, of the non-line movement, maybe point us towards uh, understanding what's going on today. Um, so what I want to do now is sort of pose to you um, the socialist camps uh, internal analysis of the NAM, which we sort of discovered while researching for this friendship series we're doing. Uh, and then to get your take on uh, on it, to see, uh, to critically discuss it afterwards. So um, basically, what what the GDR or the all the socialist camp, the Soviet alliance states, they came to realize um, that global developments in the 20th century were defined by sort of this revolutionary world process. And there were three currents to it, right? There were the socialist camp, there were the national liberation movements, and then there was the workers' movement in the industrialized capitalist states. And the idea was that these three currents of world, uh, of this world process had to be unified, coordinated, and defended against by those who wanted to break them apart. 
And the NAM was then seen as sort of a social policy formation or conception of this uh, national liberation uh, stream or current at this specific moment. Yeah? So it was sort of um, an objective expression of, of what's going on within these uh, states in the third world at, the, at this point in time. Uh, and they were, it, was, it was recognized that NAM was playing a positive role on the, because it was helping to guarantee peace. But at the same time, uh, it was helping to uphold natural, uh, national sovereignty and thereby sort of restrict imperialism's uh, playing field, you know. Um, and so this, this was the positive role it was playing, but it was also recognized that these objective anti-imperialist tendencies of the NAM were inconsistent. And that was because of what you're talking about, which is this sort of the subjective intentions of its leadership, right? So of course, it's a very diverse group, but in general, these uh, national liberation parties uh, and governments are led by bourgeois or petty bourgeois forces, right? And so they have on one hand this uh, aversion to uh, US imperialism and uh, you know, they want to protect their natural resources, it's, it's in their class interest, but at the same time they have an aversion to socialism. And this leads to this sort of wavering and inconsistencies within the position. Um, and so, you know, the NAM states are sort of then viewed as, okay, they differ with us on, on crucial questions in terms of, you know, uh, what is, you know, the, the international class struggle between socialism and imperialism. Um, and, but then they also overlap on other crucial questions like peace, uh, anti-colonialism, national sovereignty, and the rejection of sort of these imperialist military pacts, right? Um, so that was the sort of basic line that had, that had formed by the 1970s in the GDR. And um, it was basically this recognition that the NAM is contested ground, right? So we need to fortify our ties with the NAM states. We need to uh, emphasize or, for, you know, um, bring out their anti-imperialist tendencies, especially through the campaigning of the socialist states within the NAM, right, like Cuba. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also need to just demonstrate that we are the natural allies of NAM. You know, if, if this, even if this bourgeoisie wants to have their national independence, they have to align with us. Um, yeah, and so what do you, is that a fair assessment? Do you think, or maybe you can give your your thought on that? I mean, I would agree with most of it uh, that it's a fair assessment, but let's look at that phrase "contested ground." I think that's a really interesting way to look at the NAM as a process. Um, by the way, the NAM still is in existence; uh, it has been dormant for many, many years, and hasn't been able to act you know, uh, effectively. Uh, the NAM also created a block in the United Nations called the G77, which now I think has about 140 members. You know, what I love is, I love when people like Joe Biden of the United States says things like, most countries are with us on Ukraine. And then he gave a number. He said 40. And I thought, come on, man. You've got to learn how to count. I mean, 40 is not most countries, you know. I admit, 40 is a fair number of countries. That's not most countries. Unless you decide that about 120 of them are too stupid to count in your mathematics, you know, and you don't really care what they think. Uh, and then he gave only one example. He said, most of the world is with us on Ukraine, about 40 countries, like Japan. And I thought, that's interesting, man, because Japan is often, I mean, come on. It's like half aircraft carrier for the United States. Um, there are so many military bases in Japan. I mean, its freedom to operate a foreign policy was demonstrated in the, uh, in, not in the attempt, but in the coup, let's say. I've called it a coup before. The coup against Hatoyama in 2009. You know, Hatoyama got elected uh, on, a, um, on a platform to remove U.S. military bases from Okinawa. And he comes to power and he starts saying, let's have a conversation about this. Obama goes to... Um, to Japan refuses to attend the state dinner, which was a huge snub against Hatoyama. And then Hillary Clinton works on the opposition and they essentially conduct what they did to Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, which is a legislative coup and Hatoyama is removed. And guess what? Nobody know, knew about it. Um, it. It was not really reported much. And in fact, nobody remembers. It's the same time roughly when the United States overthrew Mel Zelaya's government in Honduras roughly around the same time in 2009. But it's Japan. You, you don't even think that it has a, you know, who cares about these things? It's extraordinary. He said 40 countries, Japan. 
contested terrain, contested ground inside the NAM. You know, Fidel's attitude, the Cuban attitude to the NAM is where you can really get this. So, in 1961, at the Belgrade meeting, that was really the first time Latin America comes into this Asian and African process that was there um, at the Bandung Conference in 1955. Those were 29 Asian and African countries. But in 61, the Cubans come. You remember, the revolution in Cuba takes place 1959. So, it's four years after Bandung. But in 61, Dorticos, the president of Cuba, comes himself to the NAM meeting, gives a very interesting speech. And Cuba takes it upon itself to essentially go around Latin America and talk about the importance of the NAM, the importance for countries to join the NAM. So on the one side, Cuba worked to strengthen the NAM. You know, Cuba was the host of the non-aligned meeting in 1979. Only 20 years after the revolution, Cuba hosted the NAM meeting. That's an enormous accomplishment for, for the Cuban revolution. But that was one side of what Cuba was doing, trying to bring more people from South America, Latin America into the NAM process. Um, this is the 50th anniversary of the coup against the government, the popular unity government of Salvador Allende in Chile. Um, in 1973, the NAM meeting was held in Algiers, in Algeria, just about a week before the coup took place against Salvador Allende. And if you listen to the speeches, there's a point where Indira Gandhi of India goes to the podium and says, our brother Salvador Allende is not here because he is facing a severe attack and we send our love and greetings to him in Santiago. It's, it's a very moving moment in the NAM meeting. It's Castro who brought all of them into the NAM. It's the Cuban revolution that brought them in. But at the same time, the, uh, Fidel understood that NAM is limited. Because NAM was an intergovernmental body. Of course, there were observers. One of the most important observers in the NAM was the Palestinian Liberation Organization. Yasser Arafat was treated as a head of state in all the NAM meetings, but that was unusual. So what Fidel thought was, we need to create a radical version, a radical body that's outside this kind of structure. In 1966, working with Mehdi Ben Barka of Morocco, um, Fidel and others created a conference called the Tricontinental. In fact, that's where our institute gets its name, the Tricontinental Conference of 1966. This was a conference of national liberation fighters, including armed struggle, people who were in armed struggle, PAIGC from Guinea-Bissau. Amilcar Cabral comes and gives his very important speech, The Weapon of Theory. It's an incredibly good speech. They come as national liberation fighters, not yet states, you see. So he said, we must have them at the table. We must also have states at the table. So states like Cuba are at the table. So he creates a kind of left flank of the NAM. And the Soviets were backing that as well. Um, that created a body called the Organization of People in Solidarity with Asia, Africa, Latin America, also known as OSPAL. They had a magazine called Tricontinental. Contested ground, you see. On the one side, a recognition that NAM is an important body to work through, not to be criticized and junked, must use it, a place for the socialist camp to engage the national liberation forces, to engage the national liberation forces. And new national liberation governments must have a role in playing that bridge effect. Crucial role played by Vietnam in the, in the Lusaka conference of NAM, uh, that took place in the 70s, before the defeat of the United States in Vietnam in 75, Madam Bin comes to a NAM meeting and plays again a crucial role. Those who don't remember Madam Bin, I highly recommend you go and read about her life. She is now very old and quite sick, but she's still there holding on, holding the flame handed to her by Ho Chi Minh. Uh, Madam Bin was one of the principal negotiators at the Paris Peace Conference where the United States basically had to accept that they were being defeated by the Vietnamese. Um, so the NAM was this ground where the socialist camp had to play a role there, essentially alongside even these bourgeois forces to strengthen them into what Ho Chi Minh called the camp of peace. He kept saying the camp of peace is enlarging. What the camp of peace meant wasn't, you know, countries that said, let's have no military, because that is, you know, insane. Um, you can't do that. I mean, you know, they, you, you give up your military, they're going to invade you. 
Um, this is a lesson I think people have learned from the experience of Libya. Um, you know, uh, it's certainly a lesson learned in Pyongyang, I can tell you that. Uh, what happened to Libya has taught a lot of people a lesson. You know, Gaddafi said, oh, I'm going to give up a nuclear program. I'm going to pay for the Lockerbie thing. I'm, I'm going to do, I'm even going to pay for Nicolas Sarkozy's re-election. Gaddafi did all that, sent suitcases of money for Sarkozy. And then Sarkozy sent the bombers to dispatch them. It's a big lesson for people, by the way. It's a lesson learned in many countries of the global south. They studied the Libya war, seen what NATO did to Libya. They're not going to let that lesson be repeated easily. Um, but the point here is contested ground. Certainly, the camp of peace has to be widened, bring more and more countries out of the military packs. You, you may remember this or may not. But in the 1950s, the United States went country to country and tried to establish military pacts around the Soviet Union and China. There was the Manila Pact or SIATO, Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, set up in the South China Sea, again, to flank China at that end. Then there was CENTO or the Baghdad Pact, the Central Treaty Organization, to flank from beneath the Soviet Union. Turkey, Iraq, and so on, flanking. And then there was the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. NATO is not the only treaty organization. CENTO and SIATO also existed. And guess what, guys? And this is a statement to Europe, in fact. Everybody else has disbanded their treaty organizations. There's no more SIATO. You don't need it. There's no more CENTO. You don't need it. You know what exists as a relic of the worst parts of the Cold War? NATO. Yesterday, I spent two hours in the Bundestag listening to the debate on NATO and the, you know, the Vilnius in Lithuania, the next summit. Extraordinary how everybody, except one section of Delinka, everybody is pro-NATO. In fact, I thought Alliance for Deutschland, which sometimes builds itself as some sort of right-wing nutcase protest party, was going to be against them. No, they are as pro-NATO as anybody else. That's extraordinary. There's no Seattle, there's no Cento. People want a camp of peace. Seems the only war-loving people are the Europeans and the North Americans. Go figure. So maybe we can then slowly come to the present day. Um, as you both mentioned at the beginning, there's this new, there appears to be some kind of new non-alignment emerging, right? And uh, I know that the Tricontinental Institute is beginning to analyze what this is. And I was actually kind of curious to see what the right is also saying this new non-alignment is. And so I checked what the Heritage Foundation wrote. And the uh, Heritage Foundation is this neoconservative think tank right in the US, based in Washington. And they wrote an article in uh, May of last year called The New Non-Alignment. And I just want to quote a short uh, excerpt because I think it's worth referring to. They said, quote, the non-aligned movement of the Cold War was not a force for good. Neither would this one be. The movement would be yet another instrument to undermine the already severely damaged effort to build a sustainable US-led rules-based order. It would quickly be subverted as an instrument for malign powers to legitimize their actions just as the Soviets did. The free world has a vested interest in making a concerted effort to preempt the emergence of a new non-aligned movement. And of course their effort to prevent, uh, preempt it is through neoliberal reforms, you know, they want uh, market-based uh, reforms in, the, in these countries, private investment, and so on and so forth. This, obviously, to go back to your point about John Foster Dulles, it echoes what he was saying when NAM first emerged, right? It was a very hostile take on what this new force is, or what, yeah. So, in this sense, uh, why, why, do you see, why do you think the West is, feels so threatened by non-alignment uh, back then and now, you know? What's the difference? I mean, the Heritage Foundation is right in almost everything they say that the non-aligned movement threatens the US-based or US-dominated quote-unquote rules-based order. It certainly does. I mean, what is the rules-based order? Let's come to that. This is an interesting phrase that has become a term of art from US politicians and now NATO politicians only in about the last 10 years, okay? This was not a big, I, I didn't, don't remember this phrase, you know, in, Simon, what do you think? The first 10 years of the 2000s, 
I didn't hear rules based internet. This is a new thing they've conjured up. Rules based international order. That is interesting. I heard um, Susan Rice, who was in the Bush administration, on a television channel when responding to the events in Ukraine and said, since World War II, no government has invaded the sovereignty of another country. <laughs> and I thought, Susan, you were there in the room with George W. Bush and all those other Condoleezza Rice and, you know, remember them? Condoleezza Rice, whatever, you know, who knows whether they remember anything or not. I mean, that was an illegal war against Iraq. And it was not illegal because, you know, we on the left said it. Kofi Annan, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations, told BBC 2004, he said it's an illegal war. What rules based? What rules? After that illegal war in 2003, the United States basically used the last gasp of fuel that it had to assemble the world's countries into a special session of the UN where they passed this ridiculous idea called Responsibility to Protect, R2P. It's ridiculous. They were trying to resurrect the right of Western states to bomb anybody. Because after Iraq, there was a slight delegitimization. People were not buying it. You know, you can't go and attack countries like this. Millions of people's lives destroyed. So they conjured up this rules-based international order around the same time as they started talking about R2P, the responsibility to protect. You know which country was the first victim of R2P? Resolution 1973, UN Security Council Resolution 1973 in 2011, based on R2P principles. Let's go destroy Libya. Let's just go and destroy Libya. Rules-based international order. What rules? Who's making these rules? You do whatever you damn well please. The United States is not a signatory of the UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea. Okay? The US has not ratified that treaty. The UN Convention on the Laws of the Sea has a clause which says something like, you can do freedom of navigation you know, uh, exercises in order to maintain the integrity of international sea lanes. So the UN does have space in it for freedom of navigation exercises. It's only one country that has used freedom of navigation against other people, against Iran, against China and so on. United States has not ratified the treaty. And then, of course, other navies joined the US, the British Navy. And I even think there was German ships in the South China Sea that were doing the freedom of navigation. It's illegal because they didn't ratify the treaty. You can't say that you're for rules-based international order and then violate the actual rules that are there in the world, you know, established by treaty obligations in the United Nations. You can't violate rules and say, we're going to set the rules and that's the rules-based order. Very peculiar understanding of international jurisprudence and so on. Very peculiar. Okay, so they say, Heritage Foundation says that this new block is going to undermine the U.S. rules-based international order. In fact, that's true. This new emerging conversation among countries, mainly of the global south, mainly, but not exclusively. This new conversation that they are having is about creating a new architecture. You know, they don't want this. Um, the Prime Minister of Namibia, an extremely interesting woman, Sara, uh, I forgot her name, last name, um, she was in Munich recently at the Munich Security Conference. She was asked in an extremely condescending manner. You know, here she is, a Namibian woman being asked by a German man, why aren't you supporting the West on Ukraine? I mean, for God's sake, man, think of your own German history. You know, you colonized that country. You conducted a genocide in Namibia against the Herero and Nama people. And now you, ha you are sitting there on the podium and for all the talk of, you know, German feminism or the, that we are liberal and so on, harassing this Namibian prime minister as a head of government, mind you, asking her, why aren't you supporting our position on Ukraine? And she was so measured and so good. And she said, not today, colonizer, not today. <laughs> so this is the attitude. This is how people feel now. They don't want to be pushed around. 
the foreign minister of South Africa, Naledi Pandor, sitting beside Antony Blinken in um, Pretoria, is asked a similar question and she said, we don't want to be bullied anymore. That's what she said in front of Blinken. She used the word bully. She said, we don't want to be bullied anymore. By the way, this word bully is an extremely sensitive word in the United States because all schools have banned bullying. Bullying is a bad thing. It's not like a neutral thing. Bullying is bad. And she said basically to Blinken, stop bullying me. Wow. A black woman, a South African um, foreign minister turns to a white man in Pretoria and said, we're not going to listen to your bullying anymore. So the Heritage Foundation is right. People don't want this pseudo rules based international order. And this is a real dynamic of history. This is not something imposed on these countries. This is where we've come in the historical process. Now, it's also true that this is all occasioned by the rise of China. If China hadn't made its incredible breakthrough, this would not be possible. And the reason it wouldn't be possible is in an earlier period, 10, 15 years ago, these countries would have been reliant on the International Monetary Fund. They would have been reliant on the US Treasury Department to indicate to the Paris group and the London group to lend these countries money. They would have also been vulnerable to US sanctions. There was a TV show recently where Senator Marco Rubio, one of the stupidest senators in the United States from Florida, Marco Rubio was asked by somebody about de-dollarization, okay? It's a very big word for him. Um, Trump used to call him Little Marco. Uh, when he, you know, had this way of humiliating people. Okay, Trump was a bully. I agree. Maybe that's a bullying thing to say. But Marco Rubio was asked, what do you feel about de-dollarization? And he said something which is so accurate that my admiration for him rose uh, from somewhere near the sewer to close to the pavement. I began to think he is going to say something really stupid. And then he said, de-dollarization is really bad for us. Because what it means is our power to sanction countries will be gone. He said, we have to stop this now, because if countries de-dollarize, we can't sanction them. That's a direct quote from Marco Rubio. Okay, friends, that's what he said. So they know that China's rise, the entry of China, the bricks and road, the provision of investment for infrastructure and so on, this has undermined the power of the International Monetary Fund. It has undermined the power of the London Group and the Paris Group. Countries have a choice now. It's not like China is going to row in and save the day. That's not what I'm saying. But the emergence of China has given countries a choice. So Namibia now can no longer feel afraid that at the next IMF study, the IMF is going to show up and say, you're doing badly, you haven't followed the parameters, we're going to give you a bad score, and therefore you can't raise money on international capital markets. Because if the IMF does that, the government of Namibia is going to call Dilma Rousseff in Shanghai and say, Comrade Dilma, at the BRICS Bank, will you give us a line of credit? Or they'll call up, you know, the People's Bank of China and say, will you do a currency swap for us? We're interested. This has opened up space for these countries to have a new kind of mood. This mood would not have been possible without changes on the global landscape. And in that sense, Matthew, in that particular sense, um, the role of the socialist bloc or the socialist camp in the earlier NAM is similar. And in fact, what's interesting is NAM was buoyant when the socialist camp was strong or alive and well, and then NAM declined after the collapse of the USSR and the Eastern European um, socialist countries and East Germany. NAM declined precipitously, and this mood has revived when China has reappeared. Very interesting dynamic. You can plot it on a graph. So you got to say the socialist camp, as it were, played an enormous role in NAM 1, and it's going to play a big role. It is playing a big role in the emergence of this revitalized new non-alignment. And the Heritage Foundation, therefore, I 100% endorse the statement. Um, so maybe we can also then, before we open up the discussion, uh, just sort of discuss what this... Uh, new mood is, as you put it, in the uh, in these states. Maybe we can talk about India specifically. You know, like, what is the what is driving this new mood uh, in terms of, you know, what's the economic basis of it? Yeah, it's a great question. So, in 1991, India 
you know, when I grew up in India, it was a lot like maybe what it was like in the DDR. Um, you know, we didn't have very many Western commodities. Uh, we had our own soft drinks. It was called Thumbs Up. And it was super sweet and almost hideous, but that was the drink. And, you know, there was not many commodities. You know, you had the one pair of running shoes if you were in the middle class and you had sandals as your second option. But there was just not much in the shops. And, you know, life was, in a way, had its charms. Uh, it wasn't, I don't want to nostalgize those days, but it, it was interesting. And also, the income gaps were not as significant as you would imagine. Uh, one of the interesting features of India's socialistic period before 1991 is when you put the television on in the afternoon. Television really came to India in 80, 1983 uh, for the Asiad Games, 82, sorry, for the Asiad Games, the Olympics of Asia. We didn't really have TV before 1982. When you put the TV on in the afternoon, you got to watch four hours of agricultural programming. This was agricultural education for farmers that they would be put on and farmers could watch and see, you know, this is a better way to deal with dairy farming and so on. That's what the class character of the state was. It wasn't that you put the TV on and it's some garbage thing to entertain the middle class. It actually was an educational uh, network for people of, of the rural world. You know, it, it, you could tell, you can tell the class character of a state by what kind of uh, as it were, educational opportunities it provides for people. So, so there was my afternoon TV. I learned a lot about animal husbandry and whatever, you know, <laughs> would, whatever time I could get. Watch, but I, I will also say that I wasn't in a right mind when I watched that TV program. Um, anyway, so 1991, India faced a balance of payments shortfall and went to the IMF to try to work out some kind of deal. The Bank of London actually forced the Indian government to airlift gold to London in order for a surety against a loan. Can you imagine that? 19, July 1991, India had to put gold on a plane and, and fly it to London. I mean, the humiliation, you know, uh, all these years later, we still had to do that for the English. You know, they wouldn't give us a line of credit. Uh, for all their stealing of chicken tikka masala and Rishi Sunak and all of that, we still had to send them the gold. You know, it's sick. Um, but in 91, when India did that, at that time, the Soviet Union had collapsed. By the way, I joined the Communist Party right then. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, my generation is like the battered generation, okay? We all, I'm 56 years old now, so you can imagine um, in the 90s, you know, late 80s, there we were, militant radicals, and then suddenly, what? Where did it go? What happened to East Germany? <laughs> yeah. It was hugely traumatic. I mean, obviously for people here, it was an enormous trauma to see the surrender, as it were, the assassination. I mean, the DDR was only 45 years old. It was young. It hadn't even attained middle age, and they assassinated it. And then they judge it as if it was like 500 years old. I mean, how can you judge a project which was only 45 years old? Soviet Union only lasted 70 years. Guys, that's less than people live nowadays. Uh, it's so young when it died, if you think about it, you know. Traumatic that these things happened. But at that time, the Indian bourgeoisie was quite small. It wasn't as large as it has become. And that bourgeoisie really was looking to Washington as its cultural um, marker. You know, everything from America has to come now. We must all, you know, be Americans. We've got to, of course, the trivial thing, bring McDonald's. McDonald's actually taught our people a lot, okay? It also taught the Chinese. There was a great anthropological study of McDonald's in Beijing. McDonald's taught us how to queue. I don't know if you've thought about this, but it's actually the first time I went into a shop where there were these metal barriers you know, normally in India, a thousand people are at the counter at the same time, pushing, shoving, trying to get a cup of tea or whatever, money, as if they're betting in the stock market or on <laughs> horses or something, you know. But McDonald's forced you to be, you know, modern, I suppose, stand in a queue. There was an ethnography of Beijing which said the same thing. The other thing was, McDonald's was the first place in India that I remember, public restaurant which had clean toilets. Uh, that was monumental for me. It's kind of like Disneyland. Really? I can go in there and, you know, it's not flooded? It's amazing. Um, 
they wanted to be American, you know, fast food, holidays to Disneyland, that kind of thing. The contours of life, the geography was Bombay, New York, became the geography, maybe London to some extent for a small holiday. But really, let's get to New York. Let's send our children to study in the United States. That was the contours for the, petty, for the bourgeoisie and the big bourgeoisie, the hot bourgeoisie. Over the course of the last 40, 50 years, this has changed a lot. The Indian bourgeoisie has become much more confident of itself. And this plays a role here. There's a kind of cultural shift. People are proud to be Indian. And I, I would say this without irony or whatever. Modi has actually contributed to this. Because he uses a big nationalist rhetoric. Proud to be Indian. I'm proud to be Indian. Whatever it is. You know, Modi and I have our own problems. But I would give him this. That he has actually ridden the wave of this bourgeoisie feeling happy to be Indian. And that's important. And that actually you see in many countries that used to think that the center of culture is the United States. Now they have returned and started to say, no, our society is not bad. You know, we have our own films. We have our own. We're going to holiday now in our places or we'll go to the Maldives or we'll go to Thailand. But it's in our world. We, we don't see the U.S. as the center of everything. That's an interesting development. So that's one point. Um, the second point is after 2007, 2008, it became very clear that the United States was not going to be able to stabilize the world economy by itself. In fact, the chief economist at the IMF was a man named Raghuram Rajan in, uh, in the 1990s, 2000s maybe. And Raghuram Rajan wrote a really important paper. He gave it as a speech at Aspen, at that Aspen conference, where he said that the United States economy is in a satanic embrace with China. Can't peel out. The people are basically surviving on credit cards because wage hasn't, wages haven't gone up since 1973. That's when he gave the speech. It was an accurate statement. Subsequently, there have been moves in wages, but not enough. And that's why, for instance, credit card debt in the United States, more than one trillion. That's why, um, you know, uh, college debt, more than one trillion and counting and so on. So he said this economy is not balanced. Raghuram Rajan leaves the IMF and comes as the director of the Reserve Bank of India. And at that time, there's a lot of talk in India about how we got to pivot away from the United States economy because it's not a stabilizing force. And India joins the BRICS. I was surprised when India joined the BRICS. See, India was in a formation with Brazil and South Africa called, called IBSA, which was about pharmaceuticals and agricultural subsidies and so on. That was set up in 2003. But in 2009, when Russia and China came in, I was really surprised that India was in a grouping of this size with China. Because India and China have a great deal of problems with each other. They barely can talk to each other without the issue of the border conflict and so on coming up. And yet India joined because of the class interests, in a sense, of the bourgeoisie in India that sees the United States no longer as a stabilizing force. And at that point, the concept of South-South cooperation became a material force because the bourgeoisie saw this as valuable. We will now, as the Indian bourgeoisie, trade with South Africa. We will trade with Brazil. We look for new markets. We don't need to constantly search for markets in the United States and so on. So the bourgeoisie's cultural confidence, then the material force of South-South cooperation plays a role. Um, this is not a non-alignment from below. This is not coming from people's movements. This is a non-alignment in a place like India, which actually comes from above. This is something the bourgeoisie requires. They don't want to be vassal to the United States. At the same time, they don't want to break from the United States. They, they see that as also a useful thing. So India is actually playing all the angles. You've got to give, in a sense, the foreign minister some credit for being able to design a foreign policy orientation that doesn't seek to want to break with anybody. India is in the BRICS. India is with the whole BRICS process, is in this new mood of non-alignment. But India is also in the Quad. Modi still goes to Washington and for the first time, rather than the Indian head of government sucking up to the US, Biden was sucking up to Modi. Very interesting. This was a front. 
Okay, maybe, um, and then I think afterwards we can really open up for the whole uh, crowd. But uh, I do want to try to maybe um, um, yeah, sh sharpen this discussion about, discussion about, okay, what are the actual differences when we look at this kind of d contested ground, as we've said, or for the uh, name of the, uh, the latter uh, century. And uh, maybe to, to start the idea with, like to under, um, develop an understanding of what the material base of the imperial, imperialist force really is. Like this enormous uh, capacity of finance capital that is the actual, uh, uh, the actual violent base of what imperialism actually is doing around the world. So what does it mean if the now opposing, opposing situ, uh, position of uh, many uh, bourgeois countries is actually not taking this fight against this finance capital head on and in all its layers, you know, because uh, like the, uh, the socialist camp was able to fight the international class struggle, not only uh, like uh, on, a, on the level of uh, the economic struggle, which obviously is the most important one, but culturally, ideologically, in all these kinds of forms, there was this uh, position against anti-imperialism that also opened up uh, a new perspective. So what does it mean if this kind of clear and deeply um, uh, fundamented opposition of imperialism is lacking in the today's uh, NAM? What does it especially put on the table for the progressive uh, forces? Like we, we're talking about India and Modi, but what does, what does it mean for the, for the unions, for the, like for, the, uh, for the working class movement? You know? Um, you know, there are actually two arenas where, let's be blunt and call it the imperialist camp, is basically still holding the higher ground. One is in its means of war, war making, and the other is information. These are the two arenas. In other arenas, there's an erosion of power. Like, for instance, control over natural resources. Today there was an interesting article in the Financial Times by a person who used to work in high government in the United States saying that we're going to have a problem in 30 years because we are not controlling the principal raw materials such as lithium, um, rare earth minerals and so on. And she was saying that if we don't start controlling the producers of these raw materials, she said this openly, they will create OPEC like cartels and those cartels will diminish our capacity to have dominance in the economy. I, I read this article and I thought, wow, you're right. You know, just like the Heritage Foundation, she's right that they are losing ground. But on the other side, I must say that governments of, for instance, Chile, Bolivia, Argentina, governments that have vast resources of lithium, they are not creating a cartel. Copper, for instance, again Chile, but Zambia and others, they're not creating a copper cartel. You know, when OPEC was created, OPEC was a child of the NAM. Uh, in the book I wrote about all this stuff, Darker Nations, I have a whole chapter which tells the story of OPEC. OPEC was created at the back of an envelope by the Saudi petroleum minister who was a Marxist, okay? Let that sink in. The Saudi petroleum minister was a Marxist, okay? Yeah, and a national liberation type thinker, Perez Alfonso from Venezuela, who was a conservative actually. But you know, he was such an interesting man, Perez Alfonso. He never liked to go in cars. He used to walk or ride a bicycle in Caracas. It's not easy to imagine riding a bicycle in Caracas, okay? It's not easy, even in the 1950s and 60s. I wouldn't ride a bicycle in Caracas. But he also used to put the lights out in his home and in the office. He didn't like to sit with the lights on. So he would say, if there's natural light, you don't need the lights on. He used to light candles. He was the hydrocarbon minister in Venezuela who would sit in the dark. I mean, what an interesting guy. But they created the OPEC thing. That comes right out of discussions in the UN Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, which was, a, which was a, an institution created in 1964, three years after NAM, by the NAM forces. Now, UNCTAD developed the theory of cartels. And they said there should be a rice cartel. Thailand wanted to lead that. 
There should be an aluminum cartel. Jamaica was going to lead that. But those were all undermined by the forces of imperialism. For instance, Australia killed the aluminum cartel. And that really collapsed Jamaica's economy. Jamaica still uh, exports uh, bauxite, you know, which is the raw material of aluminum. But the price, you know, it's not, nothing what it could be. So she writes, we got to form cartels. So they know that they are losing control of various aspects of of the life world, such as, for instance, natural resources. These countries are eventually going to do something, whether they cartelize or whatever they do, or whether the Chinese take advanced contracts on some of these raw, raw, raw materials, which they can because they're sitting on an enormous amount of cash. Why is the US government not sitting on an enormous amount of cash? Because they haven't taxed their bourgeoisie in decades. And that bourgeoisie has put $37 trillion in Tax havens, Cayman Islands and so on. I just read a great book about HSBC called Too Big to Jail. About HSBC, the great bank, which by the way, starts as a drug bank. It was the bank of the opium trade. Okay, And this book was about HSBC's collusion with El Chapo Guzman, the great drug kingpin of Mexico. And I thought, why are you guys surprised? It starts with drugs. And, and you know what? They didn't prosecute HSBC, even though it was clear. Guzman designed briefcases so that they could put cash, $1, $10 bills, so the briefcase would slide underneath the teller's window. You know, they designed special briefcases to launder cash in Mexico, in Sinaloa, and then bring it back into the US. It, HSBC functioned as a giant laundry. You can't have taxation, no taxation against your bourgeoisie and then have a surplus to then go and buy up, you know, mines in places. Finance capital can't come up with, conjure up imaginary money to do this. You need capital somewhere. And the US government simply doesn't have it. Interesting, Biden tried to do that investment bill. Remember, the infrastructure bill. Squeezed. They won't allow it. They are the most greedy, malicious, venal bourgeoisie on the planet Earth. And they are cutting the branch under their own feet. That's what's so bizarre, you know. Before you have a revolution in the United States, the bourgeoisie is going to implode. It's going to be a really interesting situation, you know. So when one says, well, you know, what is it? Well, the material force that's happening is undermining, you know, the capacity to control natural resources, capacity to control even forms of production, you know, how production happens. Globalization is a problem now. They're talking about decoupling, de-risking, because they've understood that they've basically eviscerated key sectors of uh, economic uh, production in, in, in places like United States, even Germany. You know, if you ever travel to Hubei province, where Wuhan is the capital, you know, where Corona uh, was alleged to have started, uh, in Hubei province, it's basically all German manufacturing. There are, most of these German companies have factories in Hubei province, in, um, in China, uh, which is why the German bourgeoisie doesn't want to decouple and de-risk from China. They're, as it is, terrified of what they've done regarding Russia, which is bringing a problem to the German people. Now you add a second decoupling with China, they are finished. Okay, So they know that there are vulnerabilities, but in two areas, major strengths, we should never underestimate this. The West, NATO countries have the power to destroy any country. You know, like they're going to meet in Vilnius. Ivo Dalider, um, who used to be the U.S. ambassador to NATO, has an article out this week at Politico. And the article came out the same day Zelensky made this comment. Zelensky said that the Soviet, the, Soviet, the Russians have, um, have, have put, I guess he said they've armed or they've put bombs in the nuclear power plant. And he said they are aiming to destroy the power plant. Okay, Zelensky said that same day, Ivo Dalida publishes an article and says that if the Russians bomb a nuclear facility, NATO must be prepared for a full scale assault against Russia. Um, you know, they could. They could go and bomb every city in Russia. Maybe the Russians will fire some nukes or whatever. But the West has the capacity to really destroy most countries in the world. Incredible capacity. Um, you know, they have a military force that is unimaginable. The United States has a military by itself that is incredible. The capacity it has to inflict damage on countries. And those who have been to Iraq, who've been to Afghanistan, been to Libya, you know what I'm talking about. 
It is incredible. I mean, to have seen Iraq is incredible. The way they bombed Iraq in 2003, wiping out all the infrastructure, destroying that country. It's going to take years and years and years for the Iraqis to get out of that trauma. But the second way in which they still have major power to inflict damage is information. Incredible power. I mean, look at the way conversations are held around the world. People are super confused about what's happening in Ukraine. You don't know how to talk about it. You say anything and they say you're a Putin puppet. You say anything and they say you're a Putin puppet. You go online and, and Google me, you'll find out I'm an agent of the Chinese government. Why? Because I don't agree with what, you know, the garbage newspapers say. I have other opinions. I have my own mind. I have my own. I don't need the Chinese to pay me, frankly. I have my own brain and I've had my brain for 57 years. Thanks a lot. You know, I don't need to be paid for these ideas. These are my ideas. This is my belief. It's super racist to say I need to be paid to say these things. I also have a brain, man. I'm not an idiot, right? I draw my conclusions from the facts, which is what Marxists are supposed to do. We draw our conclusions from the facts. Everything I've given you today are the facts, but they control channels of information. I mean, look at this country. It's incredible. Today I visited the Jungerwelt office. We talked to the editor of Jungerwelt. The state security of Germany charges Jungerwelt for class struggle. And what's amazing, my friend, is that in that case, every sociology department in Germany should be closed down. Simmel should be banned. Max Weber should be banned. Because Max Weber writes about social groups, social classes. That affects the dignity of people. If you, the German government has said, if you write about social groups, you are impacting the dignity of individuals. But the bourgeoisie can organize merchants associations or chambers of commerce. That's acceptable. Uh, but Jungerwelt is being accused of effectively terrorism. And they are under surveillance, they are under scrutiny, the editor is named in that document, the only journalist to be named. Information war. What is this? Is this real? And they say they support movements that drive violence. Okay? That's another thing they say. You know who supports movements that drive violence? Every single German newspaper that supports NATO. Every single German newspaper, therefore, on principle, is guilty of supporting a violent project, which is NATO, which has actually destroyed countries. NATO is a far more lethal and dangerous force than the PKK, which is one of the reasons why Jungerwelt is getting poked at. I don't think the PKK have destroyed any country, as far as I know. They haven't aerial bombed you know, a country in the Middle East. They haven't gone and bombed, say, Cyprus even, which maybe they can do. I don't know what their capacity is. But we know NATO has actually destroyed countries. That's how the information war gets played out. So in that sense, you know, when we talk about like, you know, whether it's, you know, contested ground or whatever it is, in two avenues, there is really no contest. They dominate militarily and they dominate on information. And people like, you know, you and I and whatever, whatever contribution we try to make from a small, little tiny flashlight into great darkness, whatever we try to do is humiliated, is disrespected, is laughed at and so on. And we need to face that. And frankly, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, about two years ago, I did a book, no, about a year ago, did a book with Noam Chomsky called The Withdrawal. And Chomsky and I spent hours and hours and hours talking about the wars in Iraq, Libya and so on. By the way, it's a great book. I hope you'll get it. I'm not saying it for any personal reason, but Chomsky does a great job at his age. You know, he is as bright as can be. His light is fully shining. At one point I said, you know, no, like you're like 93 years old, you know, and people just attack you all the time. Like every day, you're a denier of everything, like a genocide denier of this, that, and the other. You know, you're like pro-Putin, pro-Xi, pro-everything that you, as an anarchist, I don't understand how people consider you, you know, um, and he said one thing to me, he said, it doesn't bother me. I said, how? Oh, no, how does it not bother you? And he said, because I'm arrogant. <laughs> and I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> but it does bother us to be attacked in this way. But we have to be firm, we have to be together. And I know that people in the South, broad masses of hundreds of millions of people are with us in this. 
And we have to stand alongside them, be lifted up by them. This is not an individual project of eight, ten of us, you know. We are part of a big swell of history and we have to be, take our confidence from that. You don't have to take your confidence from a personal trait. You can take your confidence from that. <laughs> all right, all right. Thanks a lot, Vijay, um, for your instructive inputs and uh, very agitating inputs. Um, so uh, we do want to open up uh, for uh, you guys. So um, if you have any questions or short remarks, uh, feel free, raise your hand and uh, just speak uh, where you sit. And uh, please be fair to all of uh, the other participants, uh, make it not too long, maybe. Uh, thank you. I watched an uh, interview between Anthony Blinken and the Athletic uh, Council, and uh, that's like a few days ago, and he described the divide between, he acknowledged first that we live in a post-Cold War era, mm -hmm. and he talked about positioning the U.S. in this post-Cold War era. And he set the divide as uh, between liberal and illiberal spheres. What's your comment about that? Do you want to like Let's take a few okay. questions. Yeah, you, you just, you just. Great question, but yeah. Yeah, maybe. Uh, well, thanks, Max and uh, Matthew and the whole IFDDR for organizing this. Thanks, DJ, for the great talk. Uh, maybe just to tie in with that, uh, also you're uh, organizing this movie NATO uh, summit in, in uh, Brussels coming up and uh, just thinking about the history of the NAM, you know, we were talking about how it's leveraged on, on the existence of the Soviet Union and the, and the socialist camp which no longer exists. We have like China, which is, people call it, it's not really socialist, of course it's run by the Communist Party, it's a certain form. Uh, you were talking about that that is economic force of China and the economic uh, new center of gravity which is actually uh, developing this new NAM uh, um, uh, up, uh, you know, uh, rise again. So like, uh, c considering like when you travel around Europe, you're having this thing in Europe, so like, uh, does, it, does it mean that we need to be uh, socialists here in Europe or should we only be associated with socialists because it seems not to be only about socialism, it's also about economic power, it's about anti-imperialism. How do, how do you formulate that? Yeah. Okay. You just tell me when you're good to go. Take a couple more. One okay. more, okay. One in the back, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a similar question that might into this divide between liberal and liberal world. And where, to, where do you see the role of countries like Iran, who are yeah. in solidarity with the Palestinian cause? Who uh, I think Iran is joined as CEO a few days ago. Yes. They support uh, Venezuela with the sanctions regime. Do you think that Iran is also part of this anti imperialist uh, new Cold War axis? Yeah, great questions. I mean, I'll try to be brief so we can get more voices in. Um, the first thing is that, you know, this is a new mood. So there are no unanimities among countries. You know, there are contradictions. So, for instance, Turkey is one of the greatest contradictory <laughs> states at the time. On the one side, Turkish Airlines flies a direct flight from Istanbul to Caracas. That's a lifeline for the Bolivarian Revolution. On the other side, Erdogan, you know, and so on. <laughs> on the one side, Erdogan says, no Sweden in NATO because, you know, you guys keep burning the Quran and you have these anti-Turkish people running around. On the other side, Erdogan, who's in jail in Turkey, you know, let's talk about that and so on. There are contradictions. These are not, you see, one of the things that we have to get out of a little bit, I think it comes to a lot of our, our thoughts. We have to get out of a kind of moralistic approach to politics. We have to look for the motions of history. In that way, it's ideological to talk about liberal and illiberal. Because where's the liberal government? What is he talking about? You know, Britain is a monarchy. What liberal? There's a queen. I mean, a king. Sorry, she died. There's a king. So many European governments have monarchies. Many of them have national security laws that are terrifying. I just mentioned what's happening to Junger Welt, you know. I mean, what are we talking about? Julian Assange is sitting in Belmarsh prison, set to be extradited to the United States. So the binary liberal, illiberal, that is an act of ideology. 
There are no liberal countries and illiberal countries. There are contradictions in the world. You know, there are all kinds of monumental big contradictions and then little contradictions. So it's always the case that since the end of World War II, the Cold War mentality has tried to say the world is divided between free and unfree countries. You know, that's why you have free Democrats in, in Germany, you know. They come from that heritage of Cold War thinking. We are free and they are unfree. Uh, maybe not. Uh, also define freedom because you're free to starve. You know, is that freedom? In other parts of the world, people are not free to starve. Like they'll say, China is illiberal, okay? They'll say that. But China has just abolished absolute poverty. India is liberal, but India is rife with hundreds of millions of people can't eat. So how do we define these terms? What are these binaries doing? You know, what work do they do? It's an entirely ideological statement made by Blinken. It's not actually reflective of real currents in history. And they get away with it, you know, and have got away with it for years. It's incoherent thinking, Anthony. You speak French, you know, read more books, read Montesquieu, you know, read people like that, read Rousseau. You'll understand the contradictions of the state of nature. It's not so clear, Anthony. When he became the Secretary of State, they all said he's so sophisticated, he speaks French. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on. It's not just speaking French that counts. Read the books too, right? But it comes also to the question of Iran. Again, it's contradictory. You know, Iran plays a contradictory role. Uh, I don't see Iran as a great force, you know, in the world necessarily. Iran plays a very complicated role. On the one side, as you say, uh, it stands there on the Palestinian cause. Absolutely, right? Almost absolutely. But, you know, the question of uh, Iran's tensions with Saudi Arabia has convulsed the Middle East. You know, for years I've thought, you guys need to have a grand bargain. That was cemented, the beginning of it, in China. There are lots of contradictions. So I, I always reject these sorts of ways in which ideology doesn't allow us to scientifically look at the motion of history. You know, it's not like there's an anti-imperialist camp. I actually don't think that there's one. You know, people talk about the resistance axis. That itself is relatively ideological. I don't think it exists. Sometimes people come together, they fight together and so on. Of course, there are groupings. Of course, countries stand together. Of course, there are alliances and allegiances. You know, the countries like Cuba and Venezuela have a very strong alliance together. Of course, countries come together. It's not always shifting. But they also play the contradictions. You know, Cuba has contradictory relations with Venezuela, with uh, Turkey, with Russia, and so on. You know, it's, it's complex. Um, with China, you know, um, Cuba is in very difficult situation right now. Cuban solidarity should be on the top of our agenda. But many of the big countries are simply not doing all that they can do. Those are the contradictions. You see, uh, that's how I would, I would see it. In Europe, you know, we at Tricontinental published uh, with No Cold War a text that was co-written by Marc Botenga, who's the Belgian Workers' Party parliamentarian in the European Parliament. It's an interesting text. Okay, I don't agree with everything that we published in Tricon. This is interesting. I have some doubts about it. Mark Botenga and, and the No Cold War platform and Tricontinental are saying we need to have an independent European foreign policy. Now, I would say, don't get too excited, okay? Because we don't, we're not saying independent European foreign policy that allows you to independently go and destroy countries. Um, that's not really what's on. What's on is maybe you should rethink being, you know, to some extent subordinated to the United States, to NATO. When are you going to close down NATO and give yourself some breathing room? I think that's about where, I mean, European politics now, NATO is actually preventing people in Germany from having stable prices. Um, there's a direct link between this conflict that NATO is not allowing to end in Ukraine and the inflation crisis here. It's a direct link. So you get out of this NATO template, as the Indian foreign minister says, maybe you'll be able to stabilize your prices. All right, thank you. I have uh, written down some people on the list. Uh, we're starting with Zhao. And please keep your hands up so I can write it down. OK. Yeah. Lots of people. Please keep it short. Then. So um, I, I would love for you to speak a little bit more about the role of the national bourgeoisie in the global south, as well as in the imperial core, in this changing, very rapidly shifting uh, landscape of international relations, and especially economic relations. 
Um, you have mentioned that the national bourgeoisie in, in countries like India have played a role um, to uh, with this newfound pride in national identity, as well as you very quickly mentioned the German parts of the German bourgeoisie may not be so keen on the de-risking, uh, decoupling from China. So um, my, I, I would love for you to speak a little bit more about the possible roles of, uh, especially in the imperial core, because we live here to possibly exploit those contradictions. Um, I mean, uh, sovereignty first, right? Uh, before we can embark on a global socialist project. I mean, that is the a strategy, geo strategy of the People's Republic of the Communist Party of China, which is to reshape global trade and to provide um, and to, to 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 change the conditions of engagement so that these contradictions actually arise between imperialism and national bourgeoisie. So Take two more, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah please. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I want to pose the, the question that Rubio received about de dollarization and, um, and what could be the role of the BRICS Bank uh, in the grand sc scheme of things. Uh, what are the potentials and what are the I don't know, limitations? Great question. Colleen? Um, first, I wanted uh, to refer to your solidarity call with Cuba. Uh, on Tuesday at 10 o'clock, there will be the conference in, uh, before the, uh, standing before the uh, Cuban embassy here in, 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 in Berlin, Stavanger Street. So uh, if you can spend some time in solidarity with Cuba, that's the occasion. Bravo. I wanted to... Uh, oh, bravo. Uh, Say another thing, um, referring to the comrade uh, uh, to my right. Um, that we have to introduce also the the Comrador bourgeoisie uh, together with the national one, which is always the foothold of imperialism in these countries, possibly uh, uh, prone to a new man, and um, so. Um, there is, do you agree with this concept developed by the Third International, these contradictions between national and comprador movements? Thank you. Take another one. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. One is um, how to talk to, uh, maybe it's broader, like what what do you think would be our role here in Europe to do? Yeah. Uh, and uh, on a narrow, uh, uh, more narrow scope, how to talk to people having this petite bourgeois mindset, the Green Party mindset, the academic milieu, so to say. Like, I mean, how uh, we are surrounded by them and they uh, kill us with their uh, with their ideology and. I just wanted to hear your thoughts, like, yeah, how we, uh, because it's also about information war. And the, the second question is, um, you said, like, our time will come as communists. Can you talk a little bit more also about that? I mean, also referring to what Max said, that what, 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 what how does it open up new opportunities for, uh, the working class, but also for, for communists, yeah. Wow, can I answer that as the last question? <laughs> the, 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 yeah, it yeah no, I've written it down, Max, thanks, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but this should be the end. Um, well, let's go to de-dollarization first. Uh, I, I, I was in Shanghai at the, and met uh, the New Development Bank people, the BRICS Bank, and they have started a policy of local currencies where they're going to lend in local currencies, not in the dollar. And there is a lot of excitement about de-dollarization. Now, to be sure, this is an interesting process. On the one hand, de-dollarization is, as Marco Rubio says, weakening the US ability to sanction countries and so on. If a large part of their external debt is held in other currencies, if they're borrowing in other currencies and so on, 
They don't have to rely on credit from dollar markets and, and, and things like that. So it does weaken the ability, the levers of power that the US would have against countries, sanctioning them through economic war. Also, if the uh, world starts to shrink their dollar portfolios and if other reconciliation mechanisms happen for trade, if you're being able to trade in other currencies, this means that the United States Federal Reserve can't basically print money forever and export inflation because it's not going to be possible. People don't want dollars, so dollars are going to have to not be printed at such high uh, volumes as the United States does. This is actually going to have a negative impact in the US economy, but de-dollarization doesn't solve things for the global south. It doesn't matter what currency you're in debt in. The problem is you're in debt. So we have to actually end the cycle, permanent cycle of debt. That's really the problem. Secondly, de-dollarization is not a short-term solution. I'll give you a silly example. Okay, this country is trading with this country. They are trading in each other's currencies. But if this country has a surplus at the end of that currency's of that country's currency, this country has a surplus. What are they going to do with the surplus? Concrete terms. Russia and India are trading in rupees and rubles. There's an, a bank account in India which is filled with rupees that are supposed to go to Moscow, but the Russians don't, they can't take the rupees. The rupee is a non-convertible currency. It can't be exported. And the Russians don't want to buy anything more from India. So then you need a third party to come in and take the Russian rupees and buy things in India and pay the Russians from elsewhere. Do you understand? It was much easier just to use the dollar. You didn't have to do counterparty trades and, you know, it's too complicated. Nobody right now wants to supplant the dollar. I asked people in the People's Bank of China, will the renminbi supplant the dollar? They're not going to do it. Why? Because the Chinese pride themselves on having capital controls and control over their currency. They don't want to export renminbis and lose control of their monetary policy. It's not going to happen. The Chinese are not going to allow the renminbi to take over from the dollar. So what comes to stabilize global trade. Are we going to enter a phase where we have a basket of currencies? You know, maybe that's it. But that's a long time to come. So people who are excited online about de-dollarization should calm down. It's going to take a long time. And plus, second problem I already mentioned, it doesn't deal with debt because you're still borrowing whatever currency. We've got to deal with debt frontally. At our institute, we published a lot of text we did one recently called Life or Debt on the Sovereign Debt Crisis on the African Continent. It is an excellent read. I highly recommend that. We need to focus more on debt than de-dollarization because that's a pressing problem for most of the developing world. Now, coming to this issue of the national bourgeoisie or the comparative bourgeoisie and so on. I mean, we need to do much more empirical analysis at this moment. Uh, of how these bourgeoisies are rooted in the soil of their country, what is their relationship to finance, multinational capital, and so on. We just don't have enough research on this. So I am cautious about taking a category from 100 years ago. You know, I see the bourgeoisie, if I can be a little empirical and not theoretical, I see the bourgeoisies in countries like Turkey or in India as vacillating bourgeoisies. They are vacillating. You know, there's an enormous scope for them. Like the Turkish bourgeoisie is what? It's a two-faced bourgeoisie. There's the Istanbul elite, which would be super happy in, um, in, in Berlin, for instance. And then there's the Anatolian capital, which is different from the Istanbul elite. They have entire markets in the Arab world. You know, one of the biggest markets for the, Istanbul, for the Anatolian elite, manufacturers and so on, was Syria. And the war in Syria devastated them. They had to look elsewhere. So where did they look? They looked to Central Asia. Remember, Erdogan applied to join SCO. They made trade trips to Central Asia. All Turkic-speaking countries will now come together and we will export from Anatolia. The Chinese built a train that goes all the way up to Lake Van so that goods can go from Anatolia into Central Asia. It's a vacillating bourgeoisie. That bourgeoisie, that section of the Turkish bourgeoisie is getting integrated into the Belt and Road. They don't need Germany. They don't need Britain. They don't need the United States. They're looking that direction. Erdogan represents that bourgeoisie. He's an Anatolian 
politician. He is not a politician from Istanbul. So again, it's vacillating. We just don't have enough empirical knowledge now of what roots this bourgeoisie in the soil of their country or not. We really need to study this more. And at our institute, we're looking at this stuff. I mean, Brazil is another great example. It's so complicated to understand the nature of the Brazil, including the agro-business, the agro-bourgeoisie. Very powerful in Brazil. You know, they are the ones who dominate the soybean export sector. How to understand them? They're exporting most of the soy to China. You know, what is their role in the world? How are they seeing things? We just don't know, in fact. We don't know what is the class composition of that agro-bourgeoisie, its thinking, its mentalité, as they used to say and so on. So we just don't know enough about that. So I agree that part of, I don't know if in Beijing somebody said, this is our project, comrades. We're going to do this to intensify the contradictions in these countries. Whether that was thought through or not, that's what's happening is that the appearance of China has actually produced these contradictory moments. The example of the Turkish Anatolian bourgeoisie is an example of this. Without the Belt and Road, there would have been no opportunity for, with the collapse of the Syrian market, the collapse of the Egyptian market, when the Saudis essentially boycotted Qatar and to some extent Turkey, Turkey's economy would have collapsed even more. But the Belt and Road was the lifeline. And that was provided in a sense by the Chinese project. But these are all interesting contradictions. You know, I'm, as I said earlier, I'm a little nervous about us having firm categorizations yet. We need to study more. Again, Marxism, build theory from the facts, right? We don't take theory and put it on reality. We build theory from the facts. We need to learn a lot more. I'm saving that other one. How to talk to the petty bourgeoisie comrade? That's your trouble. <laughs> That's your problem. When I hang out with my petty bourgeois friends, we talk about art and movies and things. Because they tell me when we invite you to our homes, you are too exhausting. Just turn off for a little bit and just have a drink and relax and chat about, you know, cricket and so on. Please don't make us feel bad. That's what my petty bourgeois friends always tell me. Just don't, you always make us feel bad or you make us feel like we're doing something wrong. But I know what you mean. What you mean is how do we engage this class politically or this section politically? It's not easy because this class has taken refuge in a kind of shallow freedom politics and has ignored the working class. You know, it's quite easy to be green, for instance. Look at the Green Party. Its green has taken it to the right. Um, it is a right-wing party in Germany, in most of Europe, actually. The Greens are, have drifted to the right, on NATO, on so many things. In, inclusive of, let's, I guess, they're going to start up coal-fired power plants. I don't know how green they are anymore. Let's keep nuclear plants going, right? At least they've said that pretty directly. I think some of this lifestyle consumerist type of, of leftism is a problem for us. I, I don't think it's the problem, okay? I, I wouldn't do a frontal assault on people who think that the world will be saved by recycling. I mean... It's not for me to do a frontal assault on them, but it is annoying. And if they are annoyed by me, I am equally annoyed by them because it's sanctimonious politics. Um, there's no contact of that petty bourgeoisie in class terms. They are not out there trying to understand the delivery workers. Uh, some of these people think you give a bigger tip, you're changing the world. You know, um, This is the kind of lifestyle politics we have to deal with. But I, I think it's not a question of what you and I do. The tide of history is going to turn, and that's the thing I'm going to come to in the end. You know, yesterday somebody wrote to me, said, can you come? We have a meeting of the Berlin delivery workers, something. Can you come for it? And unfortunately, couldn't go yesterday. But I would have liked to have gone to see what that is. You know, all these migrants driving scooters to deliver food to the petty bourgeoisie. Once they start organizing, once they start pushing back, once the petty bourgeoisie recognizes that it's not the leading revolutionary force, things will change. Right now in Germany, the petty bourgeoisie actually dominates left organizations, in my opinion. Sorry to say that, but I, I just feel that that's the case. But I think once, once class politics returns to this country, which it will, it's going to really change the agent of history, as it were. Uh, that class is going to have to step aside and allow working people and so on uh, to define the contours of a left project. And I don't agree with people who say that the AFD 
is you know organizing working class people. Uh, that is a petty bourgeois party as well. It's a petty bourgeois party of the right. Uh, I find news depictions of them saying, well, they are picking up the base of the left. I I'm not sure about that. Every AFD person I've ever encountered is basically a petty bourgeois delusionary and certainly doesn't seem to have any grip on the motion of history. But I'll come back to that second at the end. Promise, Max. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, the Brazilian covered it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanna, the question I had since uh, two days ago, it was recently President Lula was in a question about Venezuela. And they were questioning him, like how come he can defend such a country like Venezuela and say that he defends democracy. And then he answered the media by saying that democracy is a relative term, and I would like to hear your opinion. Okay. And maybe adding to to clarify this, if it's like a, if it's the only way to uh, to how to call that? Okay. Like a, to, the only way we can affirmate the will of the people is by the validating will of the people is by this voter system. Uh, or which we have right now, or this can be changed in the future. <coughs> like, uh, for example, Fukuyama uh, said the end of the history, that's it. Or we might in the future invent another way of democracy. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Hold on. Actually, I have a one comment and then one question. So, my question is. Uh, what's the uh, situation in India in the sense of socialist movement and how they see, see movie and like the general politics? And my comment, uh, I'm from Turkey actually, so um, it, it seems a little bit uh, different uh, the, uh, the, the way uh, you were saying about the Anatolian and the Istanbul bourgeoisie. I guess it's kind of like they are all together with Erdogan, and Erdogan providing a lot of uh, rights to them uh, in the sense of like uh, prohibiting uh, un unionizations and the protest. So it, both bourgeoisie uh, actually uh, benefit from Erdogan and they are all together. And like also the Anatolian bourgeoisie really like Europe and uh, really yes. like uh, buying stuff and then try to also uh, make their way to Europe uh, as well. So, yeah, I, I was wondering, uh, at, like, what level you are just trying to distinguish such uh, two bourgeois? Okay, uh, I'll note you guys down. I don't. I'm not quite sure if we are, have. We'll have time for all of it. Depends on yeah, yeah, when you should, actually. Uh, uh, when you get exhausted, okay. yeah. if, the, if that happens. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, maybe one more in this round? Yeah. Okay, Pablo. Yeah. Okay, then uh, you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And thanks for your excellent uh, lecture on today. And today I ask you, what do you think is the weak chain of the global web and the global trust? Because you know, after the Russia-Ukraine conflict, even some of the countries on the global web have shown the edge of weak chain. For, for my side, it's the Hungary and Turkey, so they have opposed on the joining the um, Scandinavian country on the NATO. Of course, they change so much for the Finland, unfortunately. And in my opinion, for the global south countries, I think there is also some weak chains in terms of first case. For example, sorry to say to Peter, I think that India is the weakest chain among the BRICS countries. And in the Latin America, in my guess, I think that Chile can be a little bit weak chain. But there is also a strong chain, like Cuba, Nicaragua, they are strong chain. And how do you think about uh, my analysis of the weak chain of the global West and global South? And the, last, and the second question is, if there is a weak chain of our side, how can we reduce the risk of them? If there is a weak chain of global risk, how can like how can we enlarge and and intensify the risk of them? 
That's my point of view. Louis Casper. Yeah, hello, I'm Max from Berlin. Thank you very much for your inspiring comments. I watched you a lot on the internet and I'm glad to see you. <laughs> Horrible thing to do. <laughs> so that's why I'm glad to see you here now. It's more kind of a comment and part of it has been answered already, I think. I, when, when you were commenting about um, mm -hmm. like the role of the dominance of the information sector as an imperialist strength, I had to think of, like I'm in a, bar, in a borough organization and we try to do things against the war. And the one thing which struck me was um, that in demonstrations, for example, I went to various, uh, as many of us probably, to various demonstrations here in Berlin, and I had the impression that always it had to be said uh, kind of as a, as a neutral stance, how bad is Putin and then how bad is NATO? Somehow I had, I was thinking, I was going to demonstrations against the war of uh, Bush the Younger against uh, Iraq. I don't remember that we were saying then first that we don't like Saddam and then we say we don't like uh, Bush or whatever. And, and, and on top of it, I mean, Putin is a person, NATO is a whole treaty organization, right? And um, that, that's one thing, and, and different other things like that. So to me, sometimes it, it's, it seems like as we were doing, and I include myself like a little bow, like to our bosses before, uh, be before speaking and not having the self-confidence, and that's why I want to link to what you, the comments you made about that one has to be trusting in his own, capacity of analysis and all that. And um, I thought maybe because as well during the war in the Ukraine, the racism came out, all the Ukrainians were welcome, whereas just before people in the same woods had to, st had to freeze to death and all that, and Europe is lecturing still the world and all that. Maybe, I mean, I know you said, well, you have to do your own class struggle, but maybe we can look as well at the former colonized countries and learn something from them in the way of how to organize since, um, Finally, most of the revolutions which had some kind of success happened in those countries and not in the, in the, in the core countries. And I wonder, because on the other hand, sorry, last thing I wanted to say, because I myself find it very difficult, because in the end it always ends up like in a discussion of uh, what, how bad is Putin or not or something, and turns away from attacking our own enemies here. And, and, um, and, and, no one, and, and, and the whole war had, had the effect of a big split, like the whole, all, everyone in the left was discussing about Putin and, and getting apart instead of coming together. So it's difficult as well to say, yeah, what you said to your pity bourgeois. I mean, always when you say pity bourgeois, I, <laughs> I include myself. I think, of course, I think you Europe is very right pity bourgeois. Yeah. We are all, but that's yeah. why I mean, that's why. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, Actually, the, the questions are quite united in the... And, you know, obviously, I was using Turkey just to exemplify the fact that we have to look at the complexities. So, you know, and we need more empirical research. It's absolutely true. Those bourgeoisies are vacillating. They are not one-sided. But that did give them the opportunity to look to Central Asia for their goods and so on. But we really, really need to study this a lot more, uh, a lot more. Democracy is such an interesting concept. You know, the communist movement and the farmers in India had a massive protest against Modi's government. They made Modi withdraw two farm bills. At Tricontinental, we did a dossier called the Farmers' Revolt in India. I highly recommend you take a look at it. Okay. Massive mobilization of farmers. Tens of thousands came from dis different districts. Millions of people were agitated into the struggle by the communist movement to some extent, but also other organizations. It was a mass struggle. There was an election in the state of Uttar Pradesh after the farmers' protest ended. And the right wing won in those districts. What is democracy? Firstly, most quote-unquote electoral democracies are corrupted by money. There's just too much money in politics. In India, it's obscene. India and the United States are the world champions of money democracy. World champions. There's so much money there, you just can't compete. You can't enter. Secondly, the media is totally against 
anybody trying to run a different kind of election. I mean, when our people get invited, just as in Germany, when they get invited to go to talk shows, the host is so partisan against them. I read a study recently that showed editors in most papers in, the, you know, in Germany and television programs vote for green. 80% of them or something vote for the greens. Now, maybe they are broad-minded and fair to everybody, but they're certainly not fair to the left. There is an entire set of opinions that are basically, as they say, verboten. You know, they're just outside the mainstream, not permitted. And so our people go on to talk shows and everybody, all the political groups and the host are against the left. Everybody. They're not against the far right. They kind of tolerate the far right. They just don't tolerate the left. It's, it's fascinating. And I see this over and over again. You are entirely silent. So the money is against you. The media is against you. And the only way we can win is by mass organizing. But when we do mass organizing, farmers protest, the farmers turn around and say the following. I remember campaigning for one of my comrades in 1996 in, the, in a town in Uttar Pradesh, the same uh, town. She was running in Kanpur. I would go into these trade union areas with our comrades to campaign. And these you know, comrades, they would have red flag flying outside their house, trade union members. We'd go and say, you know, vote for comrade Subhashini Ali. She's standing on a, t you know her, you love her, she's great, blah, blah, you know, the classic campaigning speech. You know her, you love her, vote for her, you know, that nonsense. They come to you and they say, comrade, we love all of you. You are all the best. We love you at the factory. But here we have to vote for those other people. And we'd say, why? And they'd say, because they give us electricity connection. When we have some problem with a job, they give a job to our cousin. You see, democracy functions as a giant patron-client operation. And we in the left just don't know how to run patron-client. We're so moralistic about these things. We must be honest. We must give everybody benefit, not just that one person or that other person. I mean, these are the penalties that the left faces in so-called liberal democracy. These are real penalties, you know. It's not easy. You can organize people, they still won't vote for you. This was there in Brazil as well. People in the landless workers movement don't all vote, you know, for the left. They will vote for other people as well. There are complexities of ideology. Um, religious politics plays a role in democracy. So what is democracy, you know? What are we talking about? In that sense, Lula is right. Democracy is a road. We have to keep trying to deepen democratic participation. In Tricontinental, we use a phrase, rescue the collective life. You know, we have to rescue the collective life. This atomization of people, individualization of society, it actually affects democracy. And again, we are not the only ones saying it. Many years ago, a US political scientist, Robert Putnam, wrote a book called Bowling Alone. He said people used to go bowling, you know, they'd play sports together. Now they go alone and just play. Well, maybe that's not true. I don't think the statistics prove that. I don't see people anyway. But the point is well taken. You know, people do things by themselves. It gets hard to meet friends. It gets hard to have a collective life, a collective political life. You know, it's hard. You go for a demonstration to stand with Cuba. Maybe people don't meet each other there. They all go and they stand in their groups, even though they are together. They don't create a collective life together. There's something wrong with the direction of civilization in that sense, you know. So we have to rescue the collective life. We've been trying to do something called Red Books Day. 21st February, asking comrades to go onto the streets and read a red book in groups. Encourage other people to join you. We started this three, four years ago, this year we had a million people around the world read a red book. Initially it started with the Communist Manifesto. Read it in your language in public. You know, it's the date of the publication of the Manifesto, 21st February 1848. Now we say read any book in public. And I really hope you'll all organize Red Books Day next year. Have, you know, tens of thousands of people in Germany read a red book in a public space. Uh, go out there, claim it. And before doing that, create reading groups with people, with comrades. Sit and read books together. Bring in other people who might be interested. You know, that collective life, that's the democratic spirit and it's gone. And so the answer to the question about India is the left is doing a lot of things. Every year there's a general strike. 
It's the largest general strikes in recorded history. 200 million workers on strike and so on. Huge general strikes. We can do economic struggle. We can't convert that into political dividends. This is a problem that Lenin used to write about. And by the way, we as Marxists haven't theorized the ramparts of the bourgeois state well enough. We keep going back to state and revolution. You know, a great text, no doubt. But that text was written when parliamentary democracy was in its infancy. And besides, Lenin's great experience was in an, fighting an autocracy. You know, the, the Tsarist Empire. What happens in a parliamentary democracy? Bewildering for the working class, you know, to have a road to victory. Bewildering. Even Gramsci sitting in prison writing about, you know, maneuver and position, war of maneuver, war of position and so on. We have to update all these things. We have to study our own democratic institutions and see how do we convert the economic struggle into the political struggle. Because it's not automatic. That has to be converted. And in India, it's a big challenge for the left. Huge challenge. I mean, this idea of whether there are weak or strong chains, it's interesting because Lenin said the weak link of, of the imperialist order is Russia. And therefore, there will be a revolution in Russia. That's the phrase he uses in his imperialism text, 1916. The weak link, you know, have to hit hard on the weak link. Frankly, I don't think we have weak or strong links today. We have socialist projects that have to be defended, like the Cuban revolution, like the process. Venezuela is not a socialist country. Venezuela has a socialist government fighting a rearguard struggle against a vicious bourgeoisie in that country, which has not been expropriated yet. Brazil is not a socialist country. Because Lula wins an election doesn't mean it's socialism. He's fighting a rearguard action in, in, in Brazil. We have other socialist projects. Vietnam, in great distress, trying to rebuild Marxism and so on. Today, I don't think there are weak links as such. I don't think we're going to have a major revolutionary breakthrough in, a, in the short period. I think we're going to go through some tough, tough time. Gramsci writes in the prison notebooks, a phrase I love and use all the time. He, he describes something really important. He says there's the plowman, okay, who plows the field. He says, you know, politics is not about the person who plows the field. Who's going to be the manure? Which of us is going to be the manure? Who is going to go and fertilize the field? We are in a period from the left now of being the manure. We have to go door to door, working class communities, build trust among the workers for these ideas, bring back these ideas to working class communities. These working class communities have, have lost contact with some of these ideas. That's because we have not been doing the work of manure. Go back there, build, and then later we'll see where is the weakest link for a revolutionary project. It's not clear now, in my, in my opinion. I mean, the, the last thing, you know, Rosa Luxemburg had a great line after the Great War started. She, she had a terrific way with words. You know, in the Communist Manifesto, it says, working classes of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. And Rosa Luxemburg, in that biting way of hers, rewrote the sentence and says, the working class unites in a time of peace, but during times of war, they slit each other's throats. Wow. Rosa, red Rosa. Beautiful line. Times of war, they slit each other's throats. How easy it is for the bourgeoisie, and has been for 100 plus years, to inflict upon the class poisonous virus of jingoism how easy it is just to go into the so quickly putin is a demon i mean look let's be frank putin's speeches are super anti-communist okay the speech he gave about 1917 and then the one about you know um, about the russian revolution and so on wow you know putin read a little more man i mean the russian revolution wasn't a disaster it was a great historical event the Great October Revolution was great. Okay. I, I want to say this because, not because I want to say Putin bad, NATO bad. This is a realistic appraisal. Okay, I'm a communist. I'm a Marxist. I have my views of 1917, of national self-determination, of the role of the incorporation of the Ukrainian SSR into the USSR. 
we have our own understanding and theory we don't believe these are bad things i think these are good things what the soviets did by and large at least in these they made a hundred thousand mistakes but on these issues what are you going to tell lenin sorry comrade let's not make a move in october um february was fine for now let february last about 50 60 years and then after 50 60 years we'll maybe have an october but not right now if you read lenin's april thesis and i highly recommend you go back and read them they thought through why you need to do this because he said you know kerensky is going to abandon february it's not that october is different from february october is the defense of february it's the acceleration of february kerensky is going to take us back before february the april thesis are tremendous you know it's not like the bolsheviks made a coup it's a ridiculous idea they didn't make a coup they extended february beyond then and into october i mean it's a, it's an incredible period um anyway boy one of the worst books ever done worst collections ever made of lenin's writings was by verso books when they had zizek write the <laughs> the for, the introduction to lenin i mean of all people zizek writing an introduction to lenin it's scandalous that he was chosen to do that i mean for god's sake anyway uh, i don't want to say more on that <laughs> so the issue of this two sides you know we got to condemn both sides um look tactically tactically one has to make choices in different contexts if you're building a peace movement tactically that might be necessary you know tactically one has to make choices you know if in a context where the working class has been you know suffocated with imperialist ideology which suggests to them that putin is a demon and he's going to come and take over your house in bremen or whatever then tactically i think it's fine to go in there and say look let's just get the war to end that's a tactical decision based on the levels of organization of the working class okay we are, we are not idealistic in our politics you know we are materialists we have to understand the basis of support the levels of understanding that is permitted in a society and so on so we have to give each other tactical space to make decisions platforms can't all come with the perfect ideology you know um marxism is not pristine you know what did mao say it's not a picnic or whatever revolution is not a picnic or something like that mao said i don't know if you use the word picnic i don't know if picnic was a thing in china but uh, it's not a party i don't even know if parties were a thing but you know it's not easy Le- engels had one of my favorite lines in a review he did of marx's capital or not capital contributions to political economy 1859 engels wrote that history moves in zigs and zags it doesn't move in a straight line you know it moves in zigs and zags so you got to have the tactical space to say okay fine it doesn't matter whether we condemn putin or not in our demonstration but if it's going to allow us to bring in greater forces to stop the war machine then tactically go for it it's perfectly acceptable to build the largest peace movement possible to end this murderous war so i would say i take a position that it's not about the correct line you know we are not correct li- i mean I, i i i am not a correct line marxist you know where you impose the line on people i believe in tactical flexibility because the most important thing is not to impose a line on people but to build the clarity and confidence of the class the working class must build its clarity and confidence not that i go in there and you know take a big fire hose and fire ideology and tell people follow this ideology doesn't work like that politics does we don't want to be the left wing version of right wing bonapartism um come come to an end I, i have lots of more questions i think we have one last round okay if that's fine for you i'll try to go less <laughs> yeah and in that last round i answer the last question all right okay. all right so i have you yeah yeah so um, you mentioned contradictions and there is one which is for me it's mind blowing here in europe that uh, in this russia ukraine stuff um European countries are acting much against a very important part of their own interest and we saw you a couple of months ago on a screen here and you mentioned that Germany will have to burn down the black forest to get 
<laughs> through the winter and I come from Italy and we could have had South Stream uh, and Russian gas through Austria and but everybody in Italy is uh, so strong in this um, opinion against Russia and with China is the same you mentioned the industry so um, I would like to hear something more about this kind of contradiction and what do you think why people do not kind of um, other people do not see this and should we write this way in our um, argumentation so I'm wondering I don't want to side with German industrials who are, have they interested in China but I think it's important to tell people that this is a kind of material basis of our economy here to have this cooperation with uh, Russia and with China. When you were born, I got the first chance to get in touch with EMS, and with other uh, leading comrades of the communist uh, movement. And as the question was put uh, by one comrade now regarding India, I have noticed during the decade I was on the Indian subcontinent that this movement grew to the second largest communist party after Jap Japanese. What are, in your opinion, what is your reading why this big movement with so many mass organizations influential in the agrarian and industrial uh, field? What is your opinion why this movement is now in such a bad condition and because the bourgeoisie was at that, those days there, the working class of India also, and the contradiction between the Communist Party of China and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was also a decisive point why this movement has split into two different parties. Even today, they do exist and they couldn't find the way to come closer in order to go on together in their struggle. That's one question. <laughs> Russia, <laughs> uh, I wanted uh, to say that I see that here and in general there are lots of Marxists and they really don't know what to do and uh, so I thought I'm at Die Linke and as many of them I'm, um, I'm not happy with the direction of the party and I do not really get where this is all going so I wanted to propose uh, to anyone who is in Die Linke and or might be interested to in it uh, that we talk after. And <laughs> we want to stay in the link even though it has some issues because we don't want to end up with uh, 80 different uh, socialist parties like in India. Anyway, yeah. I think it's a good thing, right? <laughs> to be afraid to say unity. Okay. Not a question. <laughs> 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 okay, um, thank you Vijay for uh, all your talk. Um, so I, I wanted to say that uh, I think that today the uh, alignment movement probably has more importance than uh, the first phase of it, specifically because we live in the era of uh, new colonization which has manifested its mechanism which is you know like the prices caesar the death the brain drain the uh, technological deprivation of the south so uh, it's it's good also when we have some uh, governments that are not socialist but still they find their interest in stopping this attachment to the west so this takes us to the survival mood uh, yeah. as countries. But um, still, when I look to, to Syria, for example, uh, I'm Syrian, so I know from this experience. Um, I think, yeah, in, in, in today's uh, time, we have, uh, like, um, previously, when we have, like, direct colonization, we knew we have some military in front of us, so the national uh, interest, uh, this has the priority above, for example, democracy or uh, so, or uh, some economical issues. 
But today it's not the case. When we fight in our countries, I think we should work in parallel on these three issues, the, uh, the democracy, the national interest, and the economy, because in new colonialism they are really uh, very connected. Because one of the uh, tools to apply the new colonialism is to have the bourgeoisie in our countries to apply the new liberalism uh, uh, policies. And uh, yeah, um, what do you think about that? Okay, just the last one. Okay. And then, yeah, okay. Um, the capitalist society developed during centuries. It was a very complicated process, it was not a linear process, and it lasted 30 centuries. And the uh, uh, socialist revolution, or something like this, I don't know how to call it. Uh, the history is one century, uh, more or less. And I think it, last, it, it needs a lot of endurance and a lot of theoretical work, a lot of uh, setbacks also to, to achieve some kind of, of, of socialism. So what, what's your thought about this? Yeah. I want to answer this directly because I'm going to quote somebody I never quote. Um, Trotsky. Trotsky was exiled from the Soviet Union and went to Turkey, where he wrote a tremendous book, The History of the Russian Revolution. At the beginning of the history of the Russian Revolution, Trotsky says, we, meaning communists, are attacked by the bourgeoisie in the West for having failed to build socialism in Russia and in the Soviet Union. Now remember, the revolution takes place in October 1917, October, November. He's published the book in 1930. So it's still only 13 years, which is an adolescent, you know, and he's, he's writing then. And he says, we are told that we haven't yet built socialism. And he said, capitalism has been there for hundreds of years. And he says, and you're still failing. Give us time. <laughs> so it's very interesting that it's the only time I, all, only time I ever quote Trotsky is this line. Because I think it's actually extremely correct that it's ridiculous that we are so defenseless in our ability to talk about the USSR and its achievements, to talk about DDR and its achievements. That's why the Institute is so important. 45 years. How can you build socialism in 45 years? 45 years in 40 years in a... Not even, okay, 40 years, 39 years, whatever it is, it's very little. It's barely enough to start a process, and yet it is condemned. And that itself is part of the information war. And our defense of these processes is not a utopian, idealistic defense, but our crystal clear, realistic defense of these processes is absolutely essential, you know, in our times. Um, I mean, for God's sake, the Soviet Union... When I was a boy in Calcutta, for instance, comrade, the only councillors, because it was not the capital city, it had consulates, the only councillors in all of my life, the only time I'd seen a white person drive a car in India was the Soviet. All the other white people had drivers. But the Soviets drove themselves. When I would go to Gorky Sadan, which was the cultural building in Calcutta, we would watch movies and the Soviet would come and they would make the coffee and tea and come and give it to the kids. They didn't have servants inside Gorky Sadan. They made their own odd, you know, various Russian treats to give us and so on. It was all free, by the way. But we watched, well, I shouldn't say anything bad about Tarkovsky, but I watched all those movies in those years. And it was amazing. It was magical. You know, the books that we got, 1981, I got my first Three volumes of capital paid nothing for it, uh, nothing for it. You know the, the contributions they made to international socialism. I'm just talking personally. I'm not talking about what happened. You know the advances in the USSR. I'm just saying my own experience was pretty amazing. You know, uh, who gave me books to read like that? I read Tolstoy in a hardback edition. You know, my mother used to buy me a few children's books, hardback <laughs> color books. You know, with Magical Russian fairy stories. It was incredible. You know, knights and fairies and all the amazing things they did. 
I read Tolstoy's Resurrection, changed my life. Amazing book. The so most influential book on my life was Tolstoy's Resurrection. Because Tolstoy in that book shows that liberalism has got a barrier. You know, the count who raped a servant in the house, could ne even though he felt terrible about it, could do nothing to help her. Because the structure just prevented it. It's an incredible book. Uh, I don't know if anybody has read Resurrection. It's probably not read much. But the Soviets gave it to us in Calcutta. You know, that's amazing. Uh, little things, you know, small things are important. Um, in terms of, I mean, that you met my comrade EMS Nambudri Pad, and we are both sitting in a room where we both met that great Marxist theoretician and communist leader makes me feel so happy and in a way so sad as well. He was an incredible person and he was a great teacher to all of us. In our movement, he provided the theoretical foundation for us and, you know, he's so little read outside India, so little known outside India. It tells you a lot about the contours of Marxism, that still people just read European Marxists and don't read our people. They don't read Ho Chi Minh, they don't read EMS Nambudripa, that most they may read Mao Zedong, but that's about it. So thanks a lot for just mentioning his name. In India, the left movement had suffered a great blow uh, by the inability to defeat religious fundamentalism. That inability to defeat religious fundamentalism in the class was, I think, quite fatal to our growth. Um, because the right was able to pick up this anger and animosity in the population and drive it against Muslims in such a profoundly toxic way in the 1980s that where we had bastions of support, we saw them being eroded by the entry of religious fundamentalism. And I know that in our institute, we, we try to pr document as much as possible the danger of some of these ideologies and institutions. We did a text on Brazil, for instance, the rise of Pentecostalism, the rise of this religious movement that erodes the capacity of the working class to have its own political um, vision and destiny and so on. So, that was really a big thing. I'm, I'm simplifying the answer. There's other factors. One of the other factors is the erosion of social democracy. You know, look at Germany. When social democracy disappears, the left has to do the job of social democracy. It's social democracy in India that should have been out there in parliament saying that we can't allow people to starve during the pandemic. But they don't care. They are now neoliberals. So the left has to both do the job of social democracy and the job of moving towards a revolutionary situation. We have to do two jobs, two historical tasks, because social democracy has vanished. They all became neoliberals, you know, all over the world. Look at the SPD. It is hardly a social democratic party. It is a party of the right, whether it's a far, you know, near right or middle right or whatever right. It's a party of the right. They are not doing the historical task bequeathed on social democracy to fight for welfareism, to fight for advancing wages and so on. So the left has to do the task of them and our own task. It's a lot of work and we don't have enough people in our ranks. Um, I would say, comrade, that, you know, it really doesn't matter what formation you're in right now. It really doesn't matter. The most important thing is to fight to build political education among our ranks. You know, that's the most important thing, whether you do it inside your party or in another party. I mean, what I find a lot in, in, our, in our world is we're not building enough cadre. You know, we're mobilizing people to join the left, but mobilizing somebody to join a formation is not the same as cadre. Cadre has to be the manure. We have to do the work. We have to go door to door. You know, we have to, despite the fact that people might say, I don't want religious people to knock on my door, we have to knock on the door and say, I've come with a different kind of news, a different kind of understanding. I want to invite you to come and have a conversation. You know, uh, I want to invite you to talk about, for instance, inflation. And the, in our building, we're going to hold a meeting and so on, because it's ridiculous. People can't buy things and so on. We've got to go door to door. We've got to build popular confidence, clarity and so on. And cadre is required to do that, my friend. And I think... In the context of even this country, the left organizations, or Dilinka in particular, coming out of a kind of anxiety of maybe earlier experiences, just didn't build the cadre, you know, didn't build 
the ranks, the hardened ranks of revolutionaries. People who say that what is to be done was written for an autarchic situation alone haven't read that book. That book is about building revolutionaries. And boy, it's tough work. You got to train. And I'll tell you, EMS Nambudripat, he trained us. He made us understand. Comrade, you can't become a revolutionary by reading books. You got to go among the class, test yourself, see what you're made of, see how you'll fail, how you'll be useless, and then find some way to be useful. You know, that's political education. It's not about books. It's about that. The mass line and so on. Okay. Um, on the gas question, you know, this is a really interesting thought. Um, it's incredible that this continent um, is being essentially made into an energy island by the Atlantic Alliance. You know, first you lost your energy from Iran. Then you lost your energy from Libya. Before that, you lost your energy from Iraq. Then they blow up, well, somebody blows up Nord Stream 2. Okay? They are making this an energy island. And then they are saying to you, because you are an energy island, you might as well buy liquefied natural gas from Qatar and from the United States. Because you are an island. You don't have the capacity to build pipelines. It, it's incredible. I mean, if I was in a left organization here, I would make this the principal organizing tactical um, platform to bring people together. That where is this Nord Stream? Where is this South Stream? Where is the gas from Iran? What did the Yanks do to Europe? They basically made you an energy island. We will not be an energy island. You know, that's the kind of slogan that I would run with. Okay, I'm not telling you to do anything. The other thing is, in many countries, you know, you have to make a united front with people from classes that are different than yours. I mean, the concept of United Front is key in our period. We are weak. We have to work on the contradictions, make United Fronts and so on. Now, I would never make a United Front with the far right. Never. 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 Not even if we agree on something. That is intolerable. Making an alliance with the far right weakens the confidence of the class. It, that kind of tactical flexibility, in my opinion, simply my opinion, that kind of tactical flexibility loses us the prestige that we need when we go among the people. The mass line can never be gained by compromising with the worst elements in political life. So I, I would draw the line there. But apart from that, United Fronts, fair game. Go back and read the 1935 speech given by Dimitrov to the Comintern. It's an excellent speech about the importance of a United Front. It's an excellent speech. So that's what I would say about United Front and so on. Uh, Togliati, of course, the lectures of Togliati given in Moscow, uh, which are published as lectures on fascism. Excellent demonstration of actually party work. He says, go among the people in the clubs that they have organized. They are sports clubs, whatever they are. Go where the people are. That's the mass line. The mass line isn't having a theory about the mass line. The mass line is about going among the people and risking yourself. And I think that's exactly there in Togliati's speeches. Okay, non-alignment, new colonialism, tech deprivation. Hey, listen, this is key. Um, so interesting that in the 1990s, most of the South had relatively protectionist economies, like India, for instance. But in 91, India opened the door. Trade liberalization, not currency convertibility, but still a lot of liberalization of barriers took place. But India just said, bring in the foreign direct investment, take advantage of our labor and go. The Chinese did something unbelievable, which nobody else did. The Chinese said, okay, we have high quality labor here. Highly educated, they are not sick, they don't fall ill and no, don't come to work. They have good nutrition, so they're stronger and can work for the eight hours and so on. Much better, quality. I'm talking like this because I'm talking how you talk to a capitalist, you know. You say, our workers are good, solid, they won't fall ill in India. They keep getting diseases, the public transport doesn't work, they're late for work and so on. China, no problem. Infrastructure works fine. But they said, if you want to come in and invest here, you have to transfer your technology. And oh, by the way, we don't just want to transfer technology, you have to transfer the science too. And these companies, French companies went running to build uh, solar powered panels in, in China. They transferred the technology. today. 
China is the world's leader in solar panels. And French companies went running to the WTO saying, they stole the tech. And China said, but you signed the contract here. <laughs> the Yanks keep trying to say Chinese are espionage. Well, maybe there's some espionage because guess what? All companies do espionage. But mostly you signed the contract and you transferred tech. And then we made it better than you because you also transferred science. And then we made it better. Huawei towers, much better than Nokia or anybody else's towers. Too bad, Germany. You're not going to have Huawei towers. You still have Huawei tools, but apparently you've decided to make yourself a tech island. Uh, you're going to have 19th century tech, and the rest of the world is going to have amazing cell towers. The reception here is terrible. I had to do my show. <laughs> I, I had to do my show from the hotel room I'm staying in, and I could barely get any signal. Even the Wi-Fi was terrible in this hotel. Haven't had that problem in China. Not a problem. <laughs> 5G works perfectly in rural areas because they have really good towers. You know? So tech deprivation. Countries now look and say, well, the Chinese are going to provide us. So what do the Yanks say? The Yanks say, they're going to come and take away your privacy. <laughs> and to Germans, this must sound crazy. To Germans, this should sound crazy. But I didn't see the pitchfork rebellion in Germany when the Huawei debate was happening because the Yanks said that all the time and you guys didn't say, but Angela, they bugged your phone. <laughs> it wasn't the Chinese that did it. You're saying the Chinese might take the privacy, but the Yanks already took your privacy. But I didn't see that enter the debate or Ed Edward Snowden's revelations and so on. So in much of the world, this qu question of tech deprivation is pretty key. By the way, because you said I'm from Syria, I want to take this opportunity to say one thing. One of the reasons why Lloyd Austin, when he came to Kiev, the Secretary of Defense of the US, General Lloyd Austin, he said one of the things is to weaken Russia. But what's been forgotten weirdly from all this is that there were two interventions the Russians made, in fact, uh, twice in 2014-15. So Russia, until climate change accelerates even more, have really only two warm water ports. One is in Sevastopol in Crimea, and the other was in Tartus, Latakia in Syria. Those were the only two warm water ports the Russian had to basically base their ships uh, so that during the winter they would still have uh, military capacity outside Russia because all the other ports freeze until now. Climate change moving fast. Soon the Arctic is going to disappear. They're going to have lots of warm water ports. In 2013-14, Russians felt that their two warm water ports were going to be taken from them. One, change in government in Ukraine could have led to the, re the refusal of the new government to allow Russia to base in Sevastopol. Big issue on the table, actually, right there. And if the Bashar al-Assad government had fallen, very likely that the new western backed government would have prevented them having a port in Latakia, Syria. And Russia intervenes in these two places. Crimea brought into Russia, and in 2015, Russia militarily intervenes in Syria. But we've forgotten that. That really a lot of this was about weakening Russia in a global sense. And Russia acted in both cases. Boy, it really bothered Obama. I was living in Beirut at that time, and the Yanks were ready to come and bomb Syria. You may remember, uh, it was, I think, 2013 uh, or so autumn. They were ready to bomb Syria. I was teaching in Beirut that year, 2013-14 uh, into 15. And they were prevented from entering because the Russians threatened to intervene. And then in September 2015, the first military intervention took place. Russians had intervened with, um, with missile batteries and so on before, but they intervened in September 2015. It's very interesting, we've forgotten about these two ports and how this was also, apart from all the other things, a question of uh, Russia being able to have winter ports uh, outside its homeland. Okay, last question now. Um, why, do I, why did I say our time will come? I really do believe that we are in a period where liberals and so on simply will not be able to win elections in many countries. They simply can't go to the people and keep promising austerity over and over again. You know, they, they, their, their legitimacy is eroding in many countries. It eroded in India 
um, in the 1990s. That's why the right was able to come in. We, we, we were just not strong enough to take advantage of that situation. Um, or parties of social democracy become the right effectively. This is a period of the right where people are promising things like don't blame capitalism for your problems, blame immigrants. Or don't blame capitalism for your problem, you know, blame Russia or blame China or whatever it is. Don't look at us, look there. You know, uh, that's the general attitude of the right. They're able to create new legitimacies that don't have a material basis. And that's important. They don't have a material basis. So they can't sustain this rule for longer than 20, 30 years. They won't be able to. We're in a tough winter. I I'm saying this is going to be a winter of discontent for, for humanity for a while. Because the right is going to come in and they can't solve the people's problems. That's why we have to be the manure. Because we are the only solution after that. The liberals are not going to be able to recuperate their ranks, come up with a new project. We've got to accelerate into the people. And if we don't do that, the right is going to be there for a long time. I don't actually agree with uh, Rosa Luxemburg's slogan, socialism or barbarism. I don't agree with that. I actually think the answer is socialism. Uh, barbarism cannot sustain itself. Barbarism can last for a time, but it can't last forever. We have to win. That's it. Full stop. Wow. Wow. Thank you. I'm very, I'm very glad that we went. If you could wait just one second for me to, to wrap it up, uh, that, would be, that would be great. Although I know we all are a little bit exhausted and I'm very, I'm very glad that we have it on, on film. So I can, I can maybe rewatch some of the scenes too. Scenes. <laughs> all right. Um, I, I'll make it short. Uh, we are very uh, sincerely uh, Glad for any donations that you give us as the research uh, institute, and not only uh, financial support, but uh, we're very looking forward for uh, support of our work and following of our work, not only of the research center, but also of the Tricontinental um, Institute for Social Research. And I uh, again want to remind of our just recently uh, published archive on friendship, which is, I think, hopefully, going to point to some of the uh, topics uh, that uh, you have taken us through uh, with the whole journey uh, in more detail and uh, allowing us to uh, elaborate this discussion even further. Mm -hmm.